once again to a later than usual episode of Best Boys, a podcast about movies. I'm your host, Jurassic Mark, and I'm thinking about, honestly, just thinking about making the annual release date of these things uh, whenever they come out, considering uh, it's been a little hectic annual over the summer. Date? Yeah. Annual month. Is that the right term? Annual monthly? Whatever. It works. They understand. Mm-hmm. But uh, yeah, same as last month, uh, as last episode. With me once again is my good buddy, Chris. Howdy. Yeah. Uh, and I mean, if, if anybody's listening, they probably know where to find you by now, but oh, in yeah. case this is, uh, anyone's first episode, where can they, where can they track you down at if they want to see uh, more of your stuff? You can normally find me at, uh, at Chris Costi on Twitter. Um, yeah, that's, that's the main place to look for me. Sorry, Fantastic. at Chris underscore Costi. It'll be in the description. You can just click it. Yeah. The <laughs> underscore makes the whole thing. It brings yeah. it all together. Yeah, it brings yeah. you to Are the you still page, doing so a... yeah. Yeah. Are you, are you still doing a YouTube animations? Oh, yes, I am still currently working for uh, Alex Clark. Gotcha. Yeah. There will be a link for that as well. Mm-hmm. So, uh, yeah, this is the episode coming out in July in which we talk about the stuff in June. Uh, let's kick things off with some trailers, which there weren't a whole lot of, especially compared to the end of May, the start of June, you know? Yeah, kind of slow deluge. going this time. Yeah. We got we got tons of big big trailers and this we got like a couple yeah like nothing nothing really insane I mean we got Creed two mm-hmm. which uh, I know people should be excited for I never saw Creed one uh, I never saw any of the Rockies actually which is the least patriotic thing I could be saying <laughs> uh, this close on, to Fourth of July this, the week <laughs> on this the week where Sylvester Stallone uppercutted the King of England mm-hmm. for our rights. Uh, yeah, no, I think that could make for a good marathon, I think. Maybe just go through all the Rocky movies and then Creed and then go see Creed 2. Hell yeah. That could be a fun time. Uh, Creed's very good. From what, I have seen it. It's awesome. Oh, you saw Creed? Yeah. Yeah. It's real good. That's that's what I've heard from everybody is that apparently it's like amazing and it's a soft reboot that kind of elevates beyond being just a soft reboot. Yes, it definitely is like... If you stripped it down to the barest of bones, it's a soft reboot. But otherwise, it's, it's a completely right. new, yeah. uh, like, origin story, I guess. Feels weird to say that about, like, a non-superhero, but yeah. I mean, Rocky Balboa ended this Cold War with a boxing match. That's so true. they're basically superhuman at this point. But uh, also, apparently, yeah, we we've learned too. the official exchange rate of Creeds to Rockies is uh, two Rockies for every one Creed because Rocky Creed two equals Rocky four. Damn! Wait, Rocky four? I thought Rocky four was the one with Dr- Ivan Drago. It is. Oh, so this is the. Oh wait, are, are they actually doing the thing where they bring him back? Because I remember that was in all the. Uh, fan-made posters uh i don't know if it's him like, it might be his son it's definitely like, a drago look this up real quick. Uh, according according oh, to really? the trailer that i just watched yeah <laughs> man i'm bad at my job that's <laughs> awesome because that's that's the one thing i do know about uh about the rocky movies is that apollo creed gets murdered in the ring by ivan drago spoilers for anyone who hasn't watched but, those uh, movies in the 30 years spoilers been... for the end of yeah. the cold war spoilers for history but, uh, yeah, but uh, yeah, no, Creed should be good. You know, Ryan Coogler is it, he's back for that, right? Uh, I was not paying attention. <laughs> oh, gee, it is not Ryan Coogler. I'm very surprised it's not Ryan Coogler directing. I just Creed very too, much enjoy you saying the name Ryan- Coogler over and over. Coogler, it's a-, it's a fun name. He's the guy that did uh, did Black Panther, and the first Creed. Ah, uh-huh, okay. Which. You'd think they would, you know, step over their own mother right. to get him back after doing Creed, and then the like, how many billions all making of Black Panther? Like <laughs> all the billions, you know. You think he'd be, uh, he'd be worth it. Let's see what this new guy is. But doing. I mean, also he has like uh, the the ball is in his court. If he doesn't feel like it, he can just be like, nah. And there's literally nothing you can say to me to make me change my mind. That that is absolutely true. I mean, I'm I'm looking at uh, the new guy, Stephen Capel Jr., 
and he doesn't have much. Maybe, maybe they're honest. like no doing the pluck an indie director that. thing. That can work maybe, sometimes. Maybe they're do, they're they're doing the uh, the uh, the Star Wars thing where it's like let's just give it to some guy, and then if it's bad, it's hmm. that guy's fault. But uh, yeah, so we got we got a trailer for Creed two, which I know a lot of people have been looking forward to. Uh, we got a trailer for a couple other things, some stuff that. I'm going to be honest, doesn't look too interesting. There's some kind of Nick Cage movie, just action stuff. The kind of trailers you get in the middle of the summer movies. Yeah, all the, all the movies are here now. Those those movies will come out later. Yeah, <laughs> yeah you know. Uh, there's this one, Welcome to Marwin, that at least looks visually interesting. Where it's, it's about uh, Steve Carell has PTSD and from getting beaten up by mm-hmm. skinheads and he makes artistic displays with little dolls in little model towns. And so like, it looks like about half the movie is like what he's imagining. So it's animated. Yeah. Dolls I don't know whatever. if this it, is it an entirely accurate assessment, but strange. it's giving me like a Lars and the real girl type of feel to it. Yeah. I, I was going to say, um, uh, okay. Walter Mitty. Yeah, I can see that. The trailer kind of the trailer kind of reminded That's me of that fair. in tone at least. That'd be a good Which, double I mean, feature. I don't know if it'll be good. Yeah, right. Just like odd, kind of melancholic, funny guy doing yeah. a semi-serious role double feature. I feel I feel like there's a lot of those. Throw uh throw World's Greatest Dad on there for a triple feature. Honestly, I feel like we could do a whole episode just talking about like the best drama roles for comedic actors, because that tends to be where I like them the most. Because normally, yeah, I like really. my drama with a little like bit so- of levity, and they can toss that in there, and they know when to do it. It's almost like r- routinely funny people know a lot about sadness. What? No. No. Oh, boy. World's Greatest Dad feels different watching <laughs> it now than when it came out. Yeah. But still a good movie. Context will do that. In fact, it might have made it stronger. But yeah, Welcome to Marwin at least looks visually interesting. Uh, I think we also got a trailer for the remake of Suspiria, which made me retch in my mouth when I heard about it. But if I'm being honest, the trailer looks all right. It's going to be an I don't know what movie. Suspiria is. Uh, Italian horror movie from like the 70s. Girl goes to ballet school. Ballet school is front for Coven of Witches. Lots of weird shit happens over a really awesome soundtrack. I, I'm in. It's a, it, really, really good movie. And it's one of those things where you hear like, we're, we're making an American remake of it. And it's like, fuck off. But then I watched it. The the trailer, rather. Mm-hmm. And you know what? It, it looks like Suspiria. Sure. And it, and it looks just as weird and dry as the original with some new stuff in there, too. So, hey, maybe this can stand next to the original. Cool. And be be all right. Mm-hmm. Um, in terms of big trailers, uh, one that I saw a lot of people talking about, we got a, another trailer for The Predator, which is directed by Shane Black, who was in the original Predator and was given arguably the best line of that entire movie. Wasn't, uh, wasn't he the writer? Or was that some other guy? Uh, did he write? Did he write the first Predator? I know there was some. I know there was some was writer there. that like absolutely did not need to be in like the group, and he's just like the one scrawny dude who's acting in it because that was his like that was his caveat in the in the script. It very well might have been him. Okay, yeah. According to Wikipedia, he was an uncredited script doctor for the original Predator. Yes. I think that's what happened. So he he helped out, but he mainly played uh, Rick, who has one of the best lines in the entire movie. Billy! Billy! The other day, I was going down to my girlfriend. I said to her, Jeez, you got a big pussy. Jeez, you got a big pussy. She said, why did you say that twice? And I said, I didn't. See, it's because of the echo. Where the... <laughs> love it nothing can beat though uh not even dialogue but like 
anytime I see like two beefy dudes in a movie, even if they never interact, I immediately just picture like the fucking the uh, manliest yeah. handshake ever right at the beginning there. Oh man, so good. <laughs> So good. I'm, I'm going to see if I can't work this into the thumbnail for this episode, but there's an amazing headline that I will never not share whenever it comes across my news feed. And it's a uh, survey shows, according to men, marriage, not as good as predator. Oh, I've seen, yeah, I've seen that. And it's, and it's just got a picture of like, it's got a, just a screen cap of predator. And it's like, according to a survey of X amount of men, the 1980 something Schwarzenegger action cult classic is not as good as finding your one true love and living with them for the rest I of your you life. I think you switched those, but yes. Or other way, yeah. And it's like, yep, yeah, prob- probably. Predator's really fucking good. <laughs> Predator's really good. Fuck, I should watch Predator <laughs> like right now. Podcast is canceled. Maybe that's what I'll do. Podcast is canceled. We'll come back after we watch Predator. Uh, and we're back. Oh, God. You know what? The- you know what this made me think of? Uh, I remember weird, weird random access memory. Our first tangent of the episode, I think. Of the uh, show, I think. We don't Back go on in tangent. high school. <laughs> right? That's not like us at all. Uh, I remember back in high school, I was in an earth science class. And sure. it was around 2012. So we were watching a documentary on all the 2012 uh, conspiracy theories. Right. Because, because it was topical. And, you know, the teacher had nothing better to do that day. So we were watching it and it was talking about like why people believe in this. And it's like, oh, according to the Mayan calendar, like uh, there's going to be an extinction level event. And it's like, uh, you know, the last time this happened was when we think the dinosaurs got wiped out or whatever, you know, like Mm -hmm. BS, but interesting at least. Yeah. And they kept talking about like uh, meteors and stuff. They were like, you know, this is the KT extinction event that wiped out the dinosaurs. Cut to... Uh, CGI meteor going through space and it's got this dramatic music that, and I remember sitting there in class being like I've heard that before I'm going to wait and listen until it gets to that segment again it shows the meteor again and I hear the like and I remember in the middle of class everyone was half asleep I slammed down on my lab table and went that's fucking predator <laughs> And I shit you not, someone had ripped the theme from Predator and played it over footage of the meteor that wiped out the dinosaurs while talking about the 2012 Mayan calendar conspiracy. I mean, the meteor was the biggest predator of all. (laughs) The the meteor came to Earth to hunt. (laughs) Oh my god, that's going to be the plot of the next Predator movie, isn't it? Before they fought the xenomorphs in a Mayan temple, they fought the dinosaurs, but one of them got overrun. And they set off a predator bomb, and that's what wiped out the dinosaurs. I mean, this new predator is very vocally about evolution, so... Holy fuck. Shane Black, call me. I've got a treatment for you. Also, can I just say, when they when they pointed out, like, the, the ultimate predator, and he walks out, and he's, like, taller, and, like, he's, like, darker colored, like, he's mostly pitch black. Uh, Big buff. The- big black the, the only thing that ran through my mind was immediately just fucking sonic adventure 2 and shadows on top of the fucking robot and he's like i am the ultimate life form <laughs> you call yourself a predator you're nothing but a faker jesus i'm the real predator god this this movie doesn't look great if i'm being honest it's got a it's got a kid uh which great it takes place in the suburbs exciting uh yeah predator reigns supreme i think and now we are now we're also gonna have to deal with that we're also gonna have to deal with uh differentiating between predator and the predator unless this one's so bad that no one would ever want to watch it in which case every normal human could just assume that when you say predator you mean predator not the predator well, now you have to talk about Predator, Predators, and The Predator. Fuck's sake. Like, add a subtitle, for Christ's sake. <laughs> the Predator. That's why they're the there. The Predator. Big Hunt. Like, I don't care. <laughs> big Hunt. Big Predator going on a big hunt. <laughs> uh, may- Ultimate Predator Stay Out. When are we going to get Predator Stay Out? That's the thumbnail. Predator Stay Out. <laughs> That's the name of the episode. <laughs> oh, Jesus Mr. Predator Christ. goes to Washington. Uh, 
Driving Miss Predator. Uh, hey, that one happened. <laughs> <laughs> oh, boy. He doesn't like aliens. <laughs> they should. I'm amazed they haven't just made a movie that's just the video game. Like the PS2 game that came out. Back in that era of PS2 like sandbox games. Remind me of the plot of that, because I don't think there was ever a time past, like, midnight at a sleepover that I've played that game. Strap the fuck in for this one. So, the game opens up in the Roaring Twenties. Okay. And you're a predator running out of a church, and you're wounded, so he sets off a bomb and blows up, like, Chicago, I think. And then he doesn't even die. He survives the explosion. So then the Predator Grand Elders come down and they're like, you fucked up real bad. You didn't even die. So they banish this Predator on a planet of like little monsters. Of like the things that they fought in the arena in Attack of the Clones. Okay. And he survives for like a hundred years. And they come back and they're like, shit's fucked on Earth because they found your technology. So now it's the future but mankind has like cloaking devices and flying cars and they're going to discover us and that's going to be really bad. So you need to go clean up your mess. So then half the game takes place in future Chicago where you're fighting future mobsters. And then there are flashback segments where you're in the twenties fighting regular mobsters who are the ancestors of the bad guys in the future. And Jesus. Then- wait, if he blew up Chicago, how'd those mobsters get away? Uh oh, they they had a they had a they had their children. They had like a baby who was oh, not okay. at the epicenter of the blast. But then so, oh, the so baby, they just commuted for their mafia work. Yeah, like okay. there's a supercomputer that is controlled by the mafioso's like wife or whatever or daughter. Mm-hmm. And she ends up taking control of the criminal organization and she's like I knew you'd be back, Scarface. Like, that's what they call the Predator in this one. Jesus Because he has a scar on his face. And she's like, I knew I'd see you again. That's why I brought you a gift. And fucking aliens show up. So it's an... And then it becomes an alien versus Predator game. And then they take the old lady who was like a biocomputer. And they're like, we're going to you know, we could still salvage this computer after the creature destroyed it. What do you think, Mr. Wayland? And he's Fuck like, I think we should call it Mother. So it's not only a Predator game, it's a prequel to Alien. It's fucking crazy. Okay, so would that be the third prequel to Alien that explains how Wayland yutani came to be? It's up there. It's one of those. There are a Three lot. Three or four. <laughs> There are so many, but my point being, Predators in the 20s, I would watch the fuck out of that. (laughs) Give me Predator period pieces. Jesus. Give me something set in during the Renaissance era, where Predators start laying siege to a castle. That'd be amazing. I could just be misremembering, but wasn't there like a thing in Predator 2 with like, uh, there was like a brief hint of like, a predator meeting a person, or maybe it was in the comics, of a predator meeting a person in, like, like several hundred years ago in, like, pirating times, and, like, he, he gets involved in, like, a pirate okay. fight, and he's just massacring both ships, uh, and he ends up, like... I don't think I've seen he this. He ends up, like, back-to-back with this one pirate who's, like, the last of one ship, and he gets, like, a grudging respect with this with this guy as they take out the the rival pirate ship. Um, oh, okay. Apparently, that's the origin. I just googled Predator versus Pirates. Okay. And uh, on Xenopedia, Raphael Adelini, seventeen fifteen. Oh, that's the name of the gun. Okay, so the the flintlock pistol that Predator gives, uh, what's his face in Predator right. Two, uh, was yeah, was from a pirate ship, and apparently that was that's the story behind gotcha. it. Gotcha. Okay. But yeah, I'd, I'd watch Predator vs. Pirates. I'd watch Predator vs. fucking anything. You know what I don't want to watch? Predator vs. like, bland humans and child <laughs> in the suburbs. I mean, the suburbs are give the me, last territory, versus... aside from, like, a rural area. We've had jungle, then we've had concrete jungle. Concrete jungle. 
And then Predator's like, he, he's retired and he's just looking to kind of lay back. So he, like everybody else, he leaves the city and goes to the suburbs. Yes. Next one is going to be set in a nursing home. That's they're going to bring Schwarzenegger back for that yes. one. He's going to be in, in a wheelchair. Oh, I, I would watch Predator versus Old Folks Home any day of the week. <laughs> We've spent nearly twenty minutes talking about Predator. Yeah, let's, let's move on. Let's move along to. Let's move along. We got a trailer that I'm very excited for. Uh, we got Venture Brothers season seven coming out in early August. Um, mm-hmm. Chris, you have not seen Venture Brothers, have you? No, I have not. One day, right. we'll just sit down for like a full week and watch it. I think before, maybe a week or two before this comes out, I think maybe we'll hop on Rabbit and just marathon all of it. Because right. I have never, I have never found a television show that is both so dense in terms of lore and history, but also so easily watchable as Venture Brothers, like. I recently marathoned the entire series over the course of maybe, like, two weekends. Damn. These episodes go down like Pringles. There's nothing <laughs> to them. But you I, could write multiple books about all of the backstory they hint at. I mean, is, they also build upon, show. like... They, they kind of use nostalgia to build a lore, from what I know, right? Like, they're, they're building off of, like, oh, yeah. Johnny Quest and, like, Scooby-Doo and just... And, like old like 70s and 60s and beyond uh cartoon shows legally dis- legally distinct versions, well yeah but like but you know it, it is you a, know it is a really uh it is a really clever way of going about things because like they have uh there's this event in universe that happened that they reference a lot in the earlier seasons called the pyramid wars the idea being that you have not gi joe slash shield which is the osi and you have not cobra which is uh sphinx right. And it's like, all you need to know is Pyramid Wars, OSI fought uh, Sphinx. And immediately, the second these two entities are introduced, you could go, oh, okay, it's G.I. Joe versus Cobra. And you know everything you need to know about the Pyramid Wars. And they kind of use that to expand their lore, because you're like, oh, okay, I get it. (laughs) Yeah. There's there's the character of Action Johnny, who is literally just Johnny Quest, but grown Mm -hmm. up and strung out from a life of boy adventuring. So when he mentions how his father never loved him because of his precious serum, you go, Oh, okay. They're making fun of Johnny quest. You don't need to see, you know, yeah. what his childhood was actually like. It's, it's really, it's brilliantly put together. It's one of the b- most well-written things I've ever seen. I don't think it has a single weak link. Honestly, the weakest part of it is season one because it's still finding itself. Mm hmm. Everything, everything after that is just building and building and building. I mean, a lot of shows uh, get like that season one mulligan. Yeah, and like, and that's the funny thing is like, even with this one, season one is like the weakest. It's still fun, but it's still better than yeah. It's better than most of the stuff on Adult Swim now. That's like, yeah, <laughs> it's 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 excellent. It's it's a great concept. It's got great character building. It's probably my favorite television show of all time it is perfect and in this trailer we get the order of the triad with dr orpheus and the alchemist and jefferson twilight who did not show up once last season much to my dismay because they might be my favorite characters (laughs) so already we know season seven is going to be a good time all right and uh but then in addition to venture brothers something else that against all odds i've been excited for I'm ready to be hurt. I know it's going to bite me in the ass. Uh, we got some set photos for Aquaman. Care of, I believe it was Entertainment Weekly. And uh, they look good. Okay. See, those I got to still look, look up. They look good. Uh, okay. Looks like he's on a sub and he's, and he's all wet. That's good. That's what I like to see. Jason Momoa looking good. Amber Heard playing Mera. Black Manta helmet looking and awesome. I mean, the best element out of all of these. My boy, Black Manta. I was so scared. I was so fucking scared for Black Manta. He's everything else, it's like, okay, whatever. Aquaman's going to more or less look like Aquaman. Mira's going to mm-hmm. more or less look like Mira. You can't fuck up Black Manta. You can't fuck him up. Because... The thing with Black Manta, for anybody not in the know, his whole characterization is that I mean, he just hates Aquaman. That's it. 
Do you need much it's more a than that for, for a superhero villain to keep coming back and opposing the person? Is why I hate you. That's why I'm back. Like he really, he fucking loathes Aquaman so much. And my favorite thing about it is I love finding people who have never heard of Black Manta or who don't understand Black Manta, mm-hmm. Black Man, Black Manta, Black Samantha, uh, and just rattling off like his list of feats. And it's like, oh, why does Black Manta hate Aquaman? And it's like, well, in one version, Black Manta's... I forget if it was either Black Manta or Black Manta's dad was raped by pirates. Jesus. And Aquaman was busy doing something else. So... (laughs) But it was in, like, the Silver Age. So it was, like, cartoonish, like, Pirates of the Caribbean type pirates. And then in another version, it's like... Black Manta tried to get some of Aquaman's blood and fought Aquaman's dad when Aquaman was a teenager. And then Aquaman's dad had a heart attack. So Aquaman got really pissed and tracked down Black Manta and killed this dude. And then he looked over to the side of the boat and sees Black Manta climbing up onto the boat. And he goes, he accidentally killed his dad. A dad. So now Black Manta hates Aquaman for killing his dad. That's the new 52 version. Jesus. And it's just like... In one of his first appearances, he fucking murders Aquaman's baby. Like, his, not even like, oh, his son. His literal, like, diaper-ass-wearing infant puts him in an air, a bubble of air and makes him fight Aqualad. And he's like, you have to choose which son you want to save. So then Aquaman beats the shit out of his sidekick and goes to save his baby. And his baby's already dead. And Black Man is like, yeah, I lied. And he swims away. And then Aqu- Aqualad is like, what the fuck? You didn't even hesitate to start fighting me. And Aqualad swims away. Jesus Christ. Yeah. And then one time, Black Manta pretended to be autistic because Aquaman what? had a... Yeah, so Aquaman had a hand made of water that could heal people. So he was like, I'm not well, I'm insane. I have autism too. So Aquaman tried to heal him. And then Black Manta was like, surprise, it didn't work. So Aquaman had a crisis of self, and then later he was like, no, I was just kidding, I didn't have autism. Jesus. It's really fucked up. It's so funny. It's like if Lex Luthor had no life in addition to having an endless bankroll. In Aquaman Rebirth, the most recent series, Black Manta showed up and took advantage of basically the Illuminati and instigated World War III between Atlantis and the United States, because Aquaman was trying to get a seat at the UN and he wanted to ruin that for him. Jesus Christ. Also, I just want Black to point Man out we're at the half hour fun. mark and we have we're not at the half hour mark and that's movies. not nearly enough for Black Manta. I don't know if you're actually going to keep in the entire explanation of Black Manta's character arc. Oh, we need to, I might edit in more. We need all the Black Jesus Manta we Christ. can get. Black Manta is one of my favorite comic book characters and I'm glad that he's got the big stupid dome helmet. Because I would not have accepted any substitute in that regard, but because it's very I mean, easy for for superhero movies to just like it's got to be tactical, fu- cool. fucking norm up the the superhero outfit, and it's like, nah, I know what I'm getting into. Make it cheesy. It's an I don't Aquaman care. Aquaman movie. You have the city of Atlantis. He's gonna command fish and sharks and whales to do things for him. He's a fish you man. Let him be have fish a, man. You can't have a gritty Aquaman movie. You just can't. You could have Aquaman do gritty See, things, but visually speaking, it's going to be Aquaman. I was gonna say, like, you say that you can't have a gritty Aquaman movie, however... You can murder his baby, it just can't be gritty. <laughs> Again, you say that, however... <laughs> <laughs> oh, God. That, that might be my favorite page. Life in any uh, book ever. finds a way. Is there, There's this thing where, in one of the older comics... Aquaman is in like a suit like he, he's being a diplomat sure and he's on a beach answering questions from the press and he's like does anybody have any questions and there's a speech bubble off screen and it's like yeah Mr. King of the Sea I got a question and Aquaman's just like no and he's like because I've been waiting a real long time to ask and he's like no and then full page spread of Black Manta riding on a big submarine surrounded by like Atlantean henchmen and he's just like, how's the wife and kid? Jesus Christ. 
It's so it's so good. It's so so good. And I really hope that they don't even try to tone any of that down. I hope he is just a complete cartoon character. But I mean, given the yeah, past DC it, movies, they always they always tend to waffle in like, oh, we're toning it down, but it's really no, it's just gonna be it's really just wacky in a different way where like they're taking it seriously. Like God, how Justice League was like super uncomfortable coming off of Batman v Superman. <laughs> you could watch the tonal shift literally change with the lighting between Zack Snyder and Joss Jesus. Whedon. Uh, right, movies uh, though. We're we're getting yeah. to movies. <laughs> yeah, we got we got we got Aquaman. Uh, the hope of the DCU rides on him, Shazam, and Wonder Woman. Sure. Too. So. Honestly, I could have. You could have put the DCEU in worse hands. I'm gonna be real. I don't know if we talked about it on this podcast, but I think we had that one thought of like them just pulling an X Men and rebooting it with like the things that they trusted, which was basically using the Flash oh, yeah. to do Flashpoint and just start back with Wonder Woman and the Flash and otherwise keep it the same. I really. If like if they were smart, that's what they do. Nothing just because same. it's it would get people in the door just for being so weird. But well, we'll we'll see we'll how see. it turns out. I against all odds, I want the DCEU to pull out of this. What is it like five year <laughs> tailspin it's been in? Because there is good stuff there, and it's just because kind of like with what Disney's been doing with Star Wars, they look at the MCU and they're like, well, we could make a mega franchise. We just gotta make a bunch of movies, and give the reins to, like, one guy. That's what Marvel did, and it's like, Marvel did that over the course of a decade. And that's why when you get to the 20th Marvel movie, people are like, oh boy, I can't wait to see the next one. And then with when you do that, like, with Star Wars or the DCEU, you get the difference between The Last Jedi's box office numbers and Solo's box that's office true. numbers. Uh I actually genuinely liked Solo, if only because I went into it with, like, no expectation. Like, I was like, this is probably going to be a fun popcorn flick. And I came out and I was like, that was a fun popcorn flick. That's that's what I've heard from a lot of people, is that it's not bad. It's just... It's not a space not opera people, that you were ex- it's like, not what that Star people Wars would expect. Be. It was like if they geared it away from the Skywalkers and onto Han Solo and took it about as seriously as he takes anything. Yeah, it's the it's the you know it's a it's a good solid uh, a good solid B minus you know you're getting straight A pluses back in the mm-hmm. 80s but this is fine for you now but uh, yeah so th- those are some of the trailers and pre release stuff we got uh, this past month movies that we watched uh, Chris was there anything you wanted to uh, talk about that you saw this month uh, yes yeah, so on my docket I have. Uh... April in the Extraordinary World, um, Ooh, which is a French animated that. movie. Uh, all of these I watched on Netflix, by the way, uh, with the exception of Incredibles 2, which uh, is on both of our dockets, I believe. Um, hmm. I don't feel at home in this world anymore, uh, which is like a Netflix I've dramedy. Yeah. And lastly was My Life as a Zucchini, which came out last year, I believe, and was like that's been on my maybe two list years for ago. a while, just because of the title. Yeah, uh, it's really good. It's short. It's like an hour. You can you can breeze right into it if you uh, so choose. But yeah, that's my docket. What's yours? Uh, let's see. I, I saw a couple movies. I went out to the theater a lot this month. Uh, I saw Incredibles 2, which definitely we're going to talk about. Uh, I watched the Captain Underpants movie on Netflix. Uh, and that was that was a lot of fun as someone who liked the books. If I, did, if I didn't read those books, that movie would, be, would have been a complete waste of my time. I enjoyed it, uh, but I also read the books. But I, I Exactly. That's, that's the thing. I had fun with all the uh, references they got mm-hmm. in there. Um, Flippo Rama was the best, that, man. That was so good. That was so good. Fuck it. We're talking about Captain Underpants for a second. Uh, yeah, no, the Flipperama part, the fucking sock puppet mm-hmm. part. It's they really played around with the animation. They played around with the visuals. I love that it was something geared specifically towards kids. 
Like they didn't do that thing where you have to parody the taxi driver or the godfather yeah. so that the adults have something to laugh at. <laughs> It, w- it was all wordplay. It was all slapstick and wordplay and fart humor. And I think that's great. Because <laughs> there's a niche for that when it's done. Yeah. Well. There, there was no cynicism to it at all. It was a very feel-good kind yeah, of case. It reminded me a lot of the comics in that they were gross out and made for kids. And, like, they also had, like, really good, in my opinion, morals and uh, lessons. Which was yeah. like, hey... Don't always like trust the adults in your life. Think for yourself. Yeah. And like you, you look at the moral of this one, and it's like, there are worse things your kid could be than be yeah. a class clown. Like, there, it's a very, like, you know, screw the establishment, laugh at what mm-hmm. makes you laugh. Art, art and free expression and free speech are all super important. And I yeah. think that's really cool. That we get a kid, we get a kids movie where it's like they're not the best kids in terms of like getting in trouble, but also they're reasonably intelligent and they're not looking to hurt anybody, which is more than can be said yeah. for the villains. And that it's cool that kids get to be exposed to stuff like that. I I also like I don't know if uh, I feel like this is something you probably picked up on as well. I loved how, for lack of a better word, like nineties, like yeah. early two or it, early it did the thing that the the like the recent Charlie Brown movie uh, did as well, where it was very vague about what time period it took place in, so it could like reasonably be when the author yeah. uh, based it on, or when y- you would read it when it came out first, or even but today, an, it could be whatever. But a nice timeless feel. Yeah, like I don't think there's a single cell phone in the entire movie. Like they, uh, their idea of like we're the cool class clowns is like they make comic books and ride skateboards yeah. and hang out in their treehouse. And it's like, I have not seen a thing targeted to children go for that aesthetic mm-hmm. in a long, long time. That, that like, hyper-specific, like, yes. Bart Simpson aesthetic. Uh, I also liked how it seemed like the underlying theme of it, in addition to all the things that we've mentioned, was just, like, not to take yourself or really anything too seriously. <laughs> Like, that's yeah, the basis right? behind the kids. That's the motive of the villain is that he takes himself too seriously. Like, that's that's a good message to send to kids yeah, while also like, having, like, the underlying fart humor. And if anybody criticizes it, it's like, well, that's exactly what we're going for, actually. What the fuck did, what the fuck did you expect? It's Captain Underpants, right? Like, I, I love that that's almost... The concept is almost like a bulletproof excuse. Right? This is a very juvenile children's movie it's called captain underpants it's right there man yeah this it it has no pretension to it whatsoever you know what you're getting into it's great i probably won't ever need to watch it again but for what it is it is a great little movie that i think i will watch it again when they make a sequel which is definitely gonna happen (laughs) they're making a uh, netflix series oh no shit yeah, it's uh, it actually looks pretty pretty solid. I really like the theme song. It got stuck in my head, uh, at I'm least as bad as the theme song for the this. movie by Weird Al, which is fucking awesome. Oh, that's rad. But uh, yeah, no, Ca- Captain Underpants. I like that DreamWorks is doing good shit again. Mm-hmm. They got out of that like we're gonna be edgy bubble and pushed that off onto Sony Pictures and Illumination. <laughs> but um, is Illumination edgy. <laughs> It's it's edgy in that kind of like we know market research shows th- that kids are very into memes and being hashtag on fleek like in that kind of sense. Okay, I can see what you're saying there. That's predominantly how the the marketing team goes. Yeah, into like it. like in, like in the opposite way of how Captain Underpants is edgy because Captain Underpants is you know quote unquote edgy in that it's like oh there's. You know, put, get your parents out of the room. There's farts in this movie, uh, you know. Mm-hmm. But then, like, you look at like, uh, uh, what the fuck? Oh, it was Happy in that Grinch trailer. It starts playing Happy by Pharrell, and it's like, look, kids, it's pop music, you know. And there's like, and whereas with Captain Underpants, it's like, and now for our theme song, please rise for Weird Al Yankovic. <laughs> Good. And it's two it's two very different flavors of irreverent. <laughs> but uh yeah, no, Captain Underpants, I, I hope that becomes a franchise, especially because it sets it up on a really cool sequel hook for 
the the talking toilets, which mm-hmm. is one of the books that I actually never got to read. But it what a what a cool movie. I like that someone took something from my childhood that I was growing up. I was like. Everybody knows about this, but I feel like I'm the only one that's into this. Mm-hmm. And then I watched this as an adult, and it was literally like every other minute was, oh, fuck, that's right. I remember that part. Yeah, no. The, I remember that It joke. was a big part of my childhood, and I, like, they all kind of jumbled together after a while. I forget when I started, re- when I, like, stopped reading them, but I definitely didn't make it all the way to the end. Um, oh, yeah. And I do remember that that was, like, a a big part of my childhood because I think when I was a kid, me and my friend would always like draw our own comics because we were inspired by that. Yeah. Uh, I would totally, I have tons of old like original characters and specifically Captain Underpants comics that I drew in like elementary school. And I, I, I remember specifically I made a villain that was just, it was absolutely just the talking toilet, uh, monsters, robots, uh, from the yeah. books, but like with a different name slapped on them, and what they, what I mad libs in was like the dribbling basketball hoops, which were just like constantly like salivating. And I don't think I got the joke when I was a kid. Like I don't think I understood how good of a pun that was. I was just like, oh, I mean, I need to make them do something gross, and then I did that. And like years later, I'm like, fuck, you didn't even know, man. You didn't even know, little me, man. Those Mad Libs books were the best. I, I remember, like, messing around with them, but I would intentionally never write in anything because I like yeah. to use them. But then I rediscovered them right around, like, like right before middle school when I started feeling edgy and I was like, I can write swears mm-hmm. into this. And it's like, it's like, stop, said Captain Underpants as he punched him in the dick. And I, I would g- stay up all night giggling Jesus. at that. It was, a, it was a good time. If you have kids... Get them Captain Underpants. Or watch it on you'll Netflix. Be, it's on there. You'll, they'll be better off for it. Yeah. Watch the movie on Netflix. Watch As the series on Netflix. Get Captain July Underpants. July 2018. Um, mm-hmm. Yeah. As of recording, Captain Underpants is all over Netflix. Get in on that. But, uh, yeah, in addition to that, I watched... Uh, I watched Jurassic World Fallen mm-hmm. Kingdom. And how was that? Which was... It was a movie so stupid that I recorded a 30 plus minute spoiler cast talking about it by myself. Uh, so I'm not going to spoil anything in this podcast. If you want to hear some spoilers, I'll put a link to that mm-hmm. in the description. Uh, it is a dumb, dumb fucking movie. And that's coming from someone who saw the first Jurassic World and went, <laughs> eh, that's fine. It's, oh boy, it's a trip. Uh, and I also saw Hereditary. Which was interesting, but I don't know. See, if I'd I heard say people I say it. that they liked it. People say that they didn't like it. I think I haven't seen it, but what I've gotten based off of people's reactions was it was eerie, but not scary. Like it was, it was, yes. it didn't jump at you with yes. jump scares and unnecessary like stuff. It just had like imagery that sat there and maintained and made you uncomfortable and for some people they were like this is what i've wanted like i've been complaining that horror movies weren't for like years and other people were like this isn't a horror movie yeah i honestly i would call it more of like a drama than a horror movie like it it reminds me a lot of a less scary version of the babadook because, the, like, the thing is, is I remember I saw it with our buddy Matt, who mm-hmm. absolutely hated it. But to the film's credit, we then spent, like, the next three hours with a couple of beers <laughs> just talking about the movie. It did something. So it's like, there was in that a reaction regard, there's something and a long there. one. There's something there. <laughs> Your mileage may vary. And, like, I think my issue with it, and I'm not going to spoil anything, uh, is that... Obviously, it's a horror movie that has right. you know a big overarching metaphor. But my issue, and like my my thing is the thing that I fucking hate is I remember I think it was like IGN or something posted mm-hmm. an article about uh, Hereditary, and I looked in the comments, and literally every comment was like, "Anybody who didn't like this movie, you're uh, you're just not smart enough to get it. You just like uh, Annabelle creation." And other jump scares, so go watch your stupid Michael Bay movies. It's possible to get a metaphor for, uh, and then not like people. it or think so, it yeah. was poorly done. That's That happens. Yeah, because that's the same shit I remember having to go through back in high school when I saw uh, fucking Inception. 
I remember everybody was coming up to me being like, oh, you got to see Inception. It was so good. You have no idea what the ending is going to be. And I'm like, is does it end where you don't know if he's awake or asleep? And they're like, no, no, no. And I saw Inception. And I was like, it was fine. I remember I had a friend that like really wanted to dissect it uh, in high school. And they did. And they, they'd, they'd come to me like way later and been like, okay, I have, I have the reasoning for why uh, Cobb is definitely not in a dream. I was like, okay. Does it matter? <laughs> like, to him? Like, not even outside of the context, but like, <laughs> he didn't seem to care, so why should I? <laughs> Jesus Christ fucking destroyed i don't know i thought i got the movie uh, not not to sit here like the fucking <laughs> king of the hill but like God. i think i got it better than him now you yeah no that was pretty brutal <laughs> oh man no I, I i fucking i can't stand it when people you just didn't get it it's like no you can get it and then also have complaints you know, like I was tempted to go through the comment section and be like, "Explain to me what this movie is about," like just to, just to see <laughs> who who actually do got it. That. Don't waste people's time or you trick know. people into wasting their time. Just to see how many people it uh well, it had a metaphor. So there, you know, like that, that's the thing. This is one of those movies, a lot like uh, the Vavitch, a lot mm-hmm. like the Babadook. Uh, a lot like The Exorcist, actually, where it's not really a, you know, ooga booga monsters coming for you movie, but it's a very creepy movie with a big sense of, uh, strong sense of atmosphere, mm-hmm. you know, a whole lot of tension, and the horror kind of comes from that. And there's a big underlying metaphor. So, you know, yeah. you have like, you know, you have, but uh, with these other movies, the metaphor is really, it could be complex, but it's very straightforward in how it gets there. Mm-hmm. You know, like for example, like the Babadook. It's like, okay, the Babadook is meant to represent this. Bing, bang, boom. And it's like, okay, awesome. You know, the Exorcist. Okay, you know, it's supposed to be, uh, you know, adolescence. Bing, bang, boom. There, got it. Got from point A to point B. Mm-hmm. Hereditary. The metaphor is very clear because it's right in the title. Right. But you have to have a fucking roadmap to get from point A to point B. <laughs> you have to get to, from point A to point B, then take a U-turn at point C, and then right around point, like, H, you should have arrived at the end of the movie. Isn't that the beginning? And there's some... Yeah, right? Starts like it's. <laughs> oh. <laughs> but it's... it's uh... It's just a little too complex. The way the way I described it is like it's uh it's like a bunch of gourmet ingredients, but then they left it in the oven for like twenty minutes too long and it came out kind of fucked up. Okay. So it's like I could tell this is supposed to be better than like, you know, your usual thing you could get at McDonald's. But the execution is what kinda messed it up, and honestly I would have a better time if I was eating McDonald's. Did you say that you were burnt out then? A little bit. It's a fucking long movie. It is very long and it feels its length, but not in a good way like The Witch. That'll happen when you leave it in 20 extra minutes. Yeah, it's uh, a a good effort, I would say, but personally, not really for me. It, it, it also depends on what uh, makes you uncomfortable. Okay. If, you, if, you, if you're the kind of person who is uh, put off by say like the grieving process or made uncomfortable by like families arguing like if you've ever been in that situation where you're hanging out with your friend and his mom starts yelling at him and it escalates i mean yeah then this is a movie about that basically oh sounds like a fun time it's not it's a very sad movie <laughs> it's a dour fucking time like even more mm-hmm. so than something like that Duck or the Witch, which are dour gray fucking movies. They are. This one is this one is just like oof. And oof. Even though one of those, I won't say which, had like a decently uplifting ending ish. Yeah. Yeah, not this one. <laughs> not here. This one this one's ending is kind of weird in that it almost explains too much, but it does it in like 30 seconds. Okay, so the opposite of mother. Exclamation. Yeah. Point. It's 
it's an interesting movie that I would not be averse to watching a second time. Okay. But I can't say that I'm excited to watch it a second time. Gotcha. I, th- I think it's been getting a little bit too much praise, and maybe that's a reason why I was disappointed by it. But Good old hype backlash. Yeah. But, uh... Yeah, those were those are the movies I saw. Was there anything out of the bunch that you uh, that you saw that you wanted to talk about more? In depth? Uh, yeah. So the first one uh, that I want to talk about is called April and the Extraordinary World. Uh, right. It is a French movie by, and you can cut this part out as I go and search up what the director's name is. <laughs> We're getting good at this. We're indicating like where we want cuts. Yeah, to like hold on, I fucked up. <laughs> um. Internet is going slow because we're recording. This is gonna be a joke because it was gonna take two seconds. <laughs> okay, so it's directed by. Christian Demare, uh, I don't know who that is. Uh, it was released by Studio Canal, um, and it's basically a takedown of the steampunk genre. <laughs> oh, I'm excited! Oh, it's it's great. It's like uh, it it basically <laughs> points out. Uh, it starts out with uh, Napoleon the Third before like the French Prussian War, um, and he's trying to get like this is all the prologue, which is the only part that I'm gonna really spoil uh and he's trying to get this guy the scientist to invent like a a serum for super soldiers uh okay and he it it goes wrong and the scientist accidentally like he brings a napoleon the third brings a guard with him and the guard starts like shooting and the thing and he blows up the whole lab accidentally killing napoleon the third uh right before the French Prussian war. So his son takes power, uh, and immediately puts a stop to the French Prussian war and calls for like a ceasefire, like a peace treaty. Uh, and so the French Prussian war never happens. And that's where the timeline starts to diverge away from the, the normal timeline. Uh, and because of that, in a way that I don't want to spoil, uh, stuff happens. Right. And all of, uh, like the greatest scientific minds of the world around that era are just being, they're just disappeared. Like nobody, nobody knows where they go. Like a certain point in time happens and then they just, they're gone. So electricity is never discovered and the steampunk era emerges because that's the best that they got. Uh, And it points out that when that happens, uh, stagnating the world at the steampunk era also stops like, the cultural morals that come with it and and everything okay. is pretty and intricate but it's also horribly destroying the environment and causing wars because first they have coal and then the coal runs out and then they try fast burning wood uh yeah oh my god and then they're going they completely decimate the ecosystem in europe and there's smoke everywhere and people have to wear gas masks for long outings and they're going to war with north america for their forests so that they can get more wood to burn and they're and they're pointing out like and this is all backdrop stuff this isn't even like the main plot but it points out oh yeah it's like wizard uh (laughs) a bit less time jumps but yeah here's an entire movie in the first five minutes. Yes, this is just explained as like a news broadcast type thing. Um, and uh, right. so all of this happens and like it points out that like the class uh, dynamics of that era are terrible. <laughs> like, yeah, it's pretty, but also like yeah. all of the various travel vehicles refuse third class passengers from speaking to anyone above them in status and like this this is all just oh like God. stuff that like comes over intercoms and stuff uh and this is one minor point that comes up at like the end uh just as like a, a tidbit in the background like everything else but uh they make a really dark joke at the end about how uh the war is stopped because they uh they had been mining uh in a certain point and they just struck oil so the energy wars are over <laughs> And I laughed so fucking loud in my empty apartment <laughs> over that joke. It was good. so good. Uh, 
And just aside from that, it's a it's a very good. Uh, while taking down the steampunk genre, it also manages to be a very good steampunk uh, movie. Mm. Um, it's a French animated movie, and so like most of those, it's gorgeous. Uh, the designs look like uh, the French comic artist Tardy's art style, um, okay. who looks very similar uh, in style to uh, Herge, who did the Tintin comics. I was going to say, looking at the, it looks like some straight up Tintin stuff. Yeah. Um, so it's a lot like that. Uh, it's very, it's very nice. It's very watercolor, which a lot of uh, French animated movies tend to be, um, yeah. or some of them. Uh, and yeah, it's, it's really pretty. Uh, the plot lines are good. It has some like Hallmark animated things uh, that at first you're like, oh, this is an animated movie. Of course, that makes sense. And then it like, it's actually part of the lore of the world, uh, which is great. And it like has to do with like the, the major like plots in the, in the whole uh, story. Uh, like also in the beginning uh, you meet one of the characters uh, and he is a talking animal. Um, and you're like, ah, oh, okay. Animated movie, talking animal. Whatever. But like, there's a reason that he is. And that isn't just like the end of his like, his plot arc is, oh, he talks because X, done. We're never going to bring it up again. He's just there to be the animal character. Like, no, there's a reason that that's uh, a thing that happens. Ooh. Yeah, it's it's good. I liked it. You can watch it on Netflix. Go do that. <laughs> definitely, definitely going to check that one out. Yeah, if, if you just, like, are vaguely annoyed with the steampunk genre, you can look at this and, like, just the background elements of it and be like, ha good. That's pretty good, because that's the thing. Steampunk is one of those things that, like, I like, but I can't publicly like it. Yeah, and this is one of those. It's like, you can like it, and it can be steampunk, but it also acknowledges, like, the faults. (laughs) Yeah, it's like, steampunk is cool. It's like, steampunk, at the same time, is probably, like, the stupidest thing I've ever seen. But it's cool, as long as you don't, you know, take it seriously. Mm -hmm. But then everybody does, and it's like, oh. Well, to be fair, the majority of our interactions with it have been people at Ren Fairs, which... Yeah. Welcome to the Renaissance, Sir Sir Reginald de Quox, as you insist on being called. Nice Game Boy Color, you super glued to a top hat, you fuck. Uh, so yeah, April in the Extraordinary World, very good. Uh, liked it a lot. Um, yeah. Were there any any of the others that you Yeah, had, I also watched uh, that you saw that you watched uh, a movie called I Don't Feel at Home in This World Anymore. Uh, yes. This one's been on the list for a while, but I, w- I wanted to give mm-hmm. it some time cuz I think that came out that came out uh, last yes, year. Yes, I believe it was it? February 2017. Um yeah, cuz I, I remember this showed up on a lot of people that I follow like Red Letter Red Letter Media and a couple other people had it on like their best of the year lists and that was the first time I heard of it like same as yeah, the Yeah, I liked Project. it a lot. So it was on. It I was think on, it. I think it speaks to like but I didn't want a to, kind of theme that you can resonate with pretty well. Uh, and please don't take that as an insult yeah. as I go to describe right. it. Uh. <laughs> <laughs> that, that, that's the thing. Like I put it on my list, but I also didn't want to make it super evident that's like, oh, I'm just playing catch up with people who are better at this yeah. than me. But yeah, uh, what's, uh, what's this okay? Movie so about? it stars uh, Melanie Linsky, who I fucking love in every role I've ever seen her in, um, and Elijah Wood, who like same pretty much. Uh, and that includes that weird fucking Easter commercial that I'm pretty yeah. sure is part of Adult Swim at some point. Um, he was in like Wait, this I weird, see. like vaguely Easter looking commercial where he's just Elijah creepy. Wood. And I'm like 99% sure it's a Tim and Eric thing. Uh, Elijah, Lord of the Rings. Wait a minute. I just searched Elijah Wood Easter I and nothing popped up. Really? What the hell am I thinking? Yeah. It was something like Easter. What is this? Uh, I did find an amazing picture of Orlando Bloom's hair circa like 2000, though. Jesus Christ. But anyway, yeah, go, go on with uh, I Don't Feel at Home in This World anymore. Right, so uh, what, what it's a movie that stars uh, Melanie Linsky and Elijah Wood. Uh, and right. Melanie Linsky... Of, uh, into Over the Garden Wall. Yes, uh, which is my Both favorite of, of her roles, but she's also had a lot of good ones. Yeah. Um, and it's about this uh, woman who has her house broken into um, and she goes through her everyday life with just this worldview that like life as a rule sucks and everybody's a jerk. Uh, 
Uh, and it is <laughs> displayed so expertly in like takedowns of typical like it it starts itself off where it like shows what kind of movie you might think it's going to be of like oh this is just a comedy uh that is like kind of cynical and then like this first scene happens where she has like an almost meet cute with a dude in a bar that just completely turns and becomes so much more realistic and terrible than it needed to be and from there you're like oh okay i see the tone of this movie now really really cynical um like like the uh like the bit in world's greatest dad where you think in the like the first five minutes that his son has hung himself but he's really jerking off yes (laughs) (laughs) uh well no first scene in it is uh she's watching like this um she's watching like riots on on a tv in this like uh hospital that she works at um Mm -hmm. and there's this old woman there who just starts spouting a bunch of racist, like, homophobic bullshit <laughs> and then dies. <laughs> and that's the start. That's a good start. And, the, that's, and like, that's after totally her lines that she says out loud and then the hard cut to her, like, grieving family who look to Melanie Linsky, tears in their eyes and go, did she have any last words? And that's the start. Beautiful. Uh, and from there, it's just her uh, with the concept uh, that a lot of people, except Elijah Wood's character, um, hold the opinion that uh, everyone in the world is a jerk. Uh, nobody apologizes. Nobody will do anything to help you, including the police. If you want to get anything, you need to rage against the apathy of the universe. Well, alrighty then. Yeah. And it's both... Uh, it doesn't really comment upon whether that's the right way to look at things or not. Uh, I like that. For most of the movie. Like, it's like, is she right? Or is she kind of an asshole now, too? Uh uh-huh. I, I like when movies that go for that kind of, like... Like, like everything sucks, dude. Mm-hmm. Like, that kind of mindset. I like when they leave it open like that. Because I feel like when you get something that is outwardly, like... Yeah, everything is bullshit dude you should totally not care and be cynical about Mm -hmm. it this is objectively the right way to be it's like okay well now this is like you know insert that clip of from daria where she explains what edgy is you know about how it how it is uh corporately acceptable counterculture designed to appeal to the youth (laughs) yes and it's like but when you leave it open it's like okay well now we're getting Mm -hmm. somewhere uh, but yeah, so Elijah Wood is the more idealistic character. Um, he's presented as like ki- kind of weird uh, in a way that definitely like off puts him to some people, but he's definitely not a bad person. Uh, he's obje- he's right. like the moral center or attempting to be uh, in the movie. And even his like uh, priorities are very skewed in that respect. Um in that he he treats certain things as being worse crimes than like other things that are completely okay. Uh, so even with him, you're like, I don't know if he's completely in the right either. I don't. Mm. Everybody's gray, uh, just different shades of it, and it's it's a very interesting movie. Um, yeah, I liked it a lot. I don't I don't really know uh, what else I can say without spoiling the general like plot line, but it's about a woman who takes matters into her own hands after her house is robbed and she feels like nobody in the universe cares about it except her. Yeah. And then what, what was the third thing you watched? My Life Yes, the last one that I watched is My Life is a Zucchini, which I heard a lot about in very vague terms. I've seen this. I've seen this on Netflix. Every time I am piss drunk scrolling through netflix i stop at that one going yeah my life is a zucchini and then i keep scrolling yes. but i always make sure i go to add it in my favorites and i go oh wait it's already there <laughs> so it's like one of these days it's gonna happen well if you have a spare until hour that day ever, comes, it's an hour and seven minutes it's a short run what am i in for what is, what is this thing about? uh okay so it is um is it, isn't isn't the netflix description like something completely fucking inane it's like an adolescent young zucchini or, or something like that possibly i remember it being something uh, weird like that i'm gonna look the it crux up now, of it but... 
Tell tell us what the crux of it is. Is uh, it's a it's a dramedy about a uh, a young nine year old boy, um, who is put into an orphanage, um, and his life there basically is like a a kid in a like ten plus uh, age orphanage, um, with all these other kids who are also older than ten, and like they're all in there for very real world reasons uh they get they get pretty deep uh i mean it's explained through the eyes of children as all of it is um and it's it's based around children but it's not like ham-fisted it's It's yeah i mean it could be a kid's movie and it's definitely from a realistic perspective of a 10 year old where like they talk about like right growing up and sexuality and their misunderstandings with it. And they talk about why the kids are there in the first place. And some of those reasons are really dark. And even though they don't elaborate on it, cause they don't have the words for it, you get what they mean. Um, right. and all of the kids like are completely like the most sympathetic children you will see. They all have very, uh, tough lives that they show you on a daily basis. Um, and it still manages to be very cute and heartwarming and like all childlike, despite showing all of these very real world things. Um, it starts off with uh, spoilers. Uh, it starts off with zucchini alone uh, at his house. Um, he has a name that isn't zucchini, but he prefers zucchini. Um, and uh, he's, making a pyramid out of the beer cans that his mother was drinking uh, because his father up and left (laughs) and his mom is now a non-functioning alcoholic who abuses him. Uh, Yeah, that's the beginning and it gets worse. (laughs) Because then, uh, long story short, stuff happens. He ends up in an orphanage. And then you get to meet all the other kids and why they're in or in the orphanage. And it's like, like this, this kid's mom got deported. And one day she came home from school and nobody was home. And like this girl, we were, we're not going to go into it, but, her, but her dad was a creep and she had nightmares and he's in jail now. Mm. It's, it's super dark and it doesn't pull any punches with how dark this situation is for these kids. And it's still, yeah, and it still presents it in I a really that. idealistic, childlike worldview of, like, this is a really bad situation. We're not going to lie to you by how bad it is, but it can get better. I mean... Yeah, and, like, uh, <laughs> minor tidbits about it. Um, it's beautiful. It's a stop-motion animated movie, so of course it is. Uh, it had a French and an okay. English version uh for the dialogue that you could choose on Netflix. Uh, funnily enough, um, mm-hmm. oh wait, no, sorry. This is actually about April in the Extraordinary World uh, that I forgot to mention. Um, backtracking half a second. The main oh, voice yeah. actress in the French version of April in the Extraordinary World who plays April is uh, Marianne Cotillard. Uh, she is not the English voice actress right. of April, despite also being like a frequent actress in american made movies and speaking fluent english i assume yeah she yeah was the, she was the english dub of the yes. little prince despite i don't know being a friend. um but so for whatever what reason fuck? she wasn't the the english voice actress did a perfectly fine job she was great um but i just i saw that afterwards and i was like huh it's, we- it's weird that she didn't just do both but okay um but in this one there's a couple there's a couple people that you might recognize huh. uh there's nick offerman who plays um the police officer that works uh, Zucchini's uh, case um, and like takes him to the orphanage uh, and is like okay. one of the other adult. He has a lot of adult figures that are good in his life. Uh, later, um, he's one of them. Uh, and there's an interesting thing with that. With like, uh, it presents a lot of different worldviews. Where like this this guy's good and he's a cop. Um, and there's this other kid whose dad went to jail and he does not like cops. Uh, and so every time, uh, Nick Offerman's character shows up, uh, he hates Mm. him and he tosses water balloons from the second floor on him. And at no point do they ever like 
does he ever like try to stop the kid or is the kid presented as in the right for doing this? Uh, they just, they just talk about like, they just present these two facts. Like this kid hates cops because his dad is gone because of the police. This guy is a cop who is nice. Both things are true. Uh, and yeah. And it's, it's nice that it like, it presents this guy as like, he's a good guy. Uh, he cares about zucchini. He's a, a decent person who's doing what he can within, uh, like the, confines of the law uh and this other kid hates cops because cops are reasons are the reason his dad is gone and he's not faulted for that they're not like he's an idiot for that he's very genuinely allowed to feel that way it makes sense yeah uh that's, and that's yeah an interesting uh that's an interesting situation it presents or at least an interesting way it presents the situation yeah it's a complicated scenario and like there's also like a bully in the orphanage who's absolutely one of the other kids there and like he never really stops being that but he also is like nice to the other kids too and they just accept that that's how he is and they get why he's lashing out and they don't like treat him terribly for it and he's not a bad character once like you get to know more of him and everybody's just very uh there's a lot of layers to all the characters and it's nice to see that all right. Yeah, it's good. My life is a zucchini. If you have a spare hour, do yourself a favor and watch it. It's very cute. Cool, cool. Then, uh, staying on the theme of animated movies, there's one that I know we both saw. Mm-hmm. Uh, big, big movie. Finally, we got Incredibles 2. Hell yeah. Which, uh, was good. Yeah, I liked it. Incredibles 2 was... Shock, Incredibles 2 was good. Uh, yeah. I prefer the original over this one any day, but it was still good. I liked both of them. I thought I I wouldn't necessarily I like, I like say that them, I but... have a favorite between the two. Honestly, I thought the oh I, for me it's definitely the first one. I thought the first one was uh, much more succinct, and I think that sequels are naturally harder. And I'm impressed with what hmm. this one pulled off. See, I think that this one had a lot of really good action, and it had a lot of really good character moments, mm-hmm. but it didn't have the same kind of thematic depth or ambition that the first one had like the first like in incredibles 2 you do not get a single scene that approaches like the not even that had to be emotionally intense but like the raw power of like the missile lock scene for example okay uh like the first the first movie you got like bits where it's like oh you know marriage is on the rocks suspected affair Mm -hmm. midlife crisis you know body image issues rekindling the spark and then in this one it's like dad's got to watch the kids and mom's got to go back to work and neither of them is super good at it but they find their own way and it all works out it's like that's very nice i feel like it wasn't given the same level of dramatic weight or it wasn't like it they didn't sit on the drama and let you feel it a lot but there were still issues that could have been yeah. presented at that like the um the whole them getting arrested and having to talk about like well do we want to go do we want to be genuine vigilante superheroes or yeah i like that scene i like that scene a lot yeah the chinese food um and yeah. i think the the biggest point for me was uh are we how, how much spoilers are we talking here <laughs> You know what movie movie's been out for when did Incredibles 2 come out? Yeah. A couple weeks ago, Spoilers, right? we can we can put like a, yeah, we'll, a time we'll stamp spoilers. for if you want to skip the spoilers. There'll be a, yeah, time time stamp in the description, but incredible yeah. spoilers are gonna start now. Yeah, okay. So I think the biggest uh moment to me, at least like watching the first movie, which I did like the night before, um, which greatly helped lead right fun. into this one. Uh as an adult versus as a kid made me focus on things more that I didn't focus on when I was a kid. Um, and I think that carried over into this movie, which was like the big, the big narrative, uh, like worry for me is, uh, that scene where the kids are home at the house and Bob gets the call that Elastigirl's in trouble and he leaves. And from then on, it's just the kids like very briefly they get lucius coming in like just barely saving them 
And like when it's just them sitting in the car, like that's when like the adult in me is like, oh my god, they're just children. <laughs> yeah, like I, I think dramatically speaking, that was the best moment, or at least the moment that came closest to like the same mm-hmm. level of maturity as the first one. Where they stop the car because and the they're like, "What do we do?" And they like they briefly touch yeah. up on Edna, and they're like, "No, she'll get taken over too." And then what do we do? Like, we gotta step up right now. <laughs> yeah, like the. With the first, like rewatching the first one, because I didn't get a chance to rewatch it before uh, I went to go see this one, but I have been watching like moments. And the first one, I think, is very interesting looking at what it was going to be and what it ended up mm-hmm. being. Not that they were anything different, but like how they presented uh, it I don't rather know if you, than what was presented. Yeah. Like the clear, the clear, all the stuff that was, all the ingredients that were in the kitchen while they were making the first one. Yeah. You know, whether or not they actually used mm-hmm. them. Like, uh, I really like there was a, a really good deleted opening. Yeah, with the barbecue where, uh, and then uh, syndrome. Yeah, yeah. Where where they're at, they're at a barbecue and uh, Helen gets into a fight with this uh, waspy uh, like attorney or banker mm-hmm. or whatever woman who does not have children who's making fun of her because it's like oh you threw your life away to chase kids around. And she gets all in her face, and this distracts Bob, who accidentally chops off his own fingers, and they have to pretend like he chopped his fingers off, and they gotta take him to the hospital to hide the fact that he's invulnerable. And then that night, Syndrome shows up, has them, beats the fuck out of both of them, has them both in the uh, suspended Mm. beam, and goes to then presumably kill their baby. And then again presumably but i guess that was going to be the twist in the original version is that he survived their house blows up with him in it and it's like damn that's an opening i like the opening we got but mm-hmm. damn that's an opening well from what i've heard he and was just a, going to be a, in the opening a one off yeah like they genuinely am yeah. going to have him just straight up die there and be like hey listen supers are like have every reason to not want to be found yeah like secret like, identities I think, uh, are really important which i think would like it was gonna be some kind of corporate like lex luther villain and then i think brad bird said he really liked syndrome's design mm-hmm. or something like that so he figured ah fuck it let's merge the two yeah. together but um th- there was another really good scene that was really good for a different reason but uh it shows you how things kind of changed between pre-production and the finished product where in the in the movie, there's a bit where uh, Helen is vacuuming the mm-hmm. den, and she sees that she sees the super suit, and she sees like uh, a little stitch on it, and she's like, "Oh, it's right. Edna," and immediately goes to talk to Edna. And like before that, she finds a little uh, a hair on mm-hmm. it, and then you get this scene, which in hindsight, I think that this version that we got in the movie as an adult, I think is much more mm-hmm. effective in that she sees the hair and she doesn't say anything about it. It's just, she goes to see him off and it's just like, I love you so much. I hope you have a really good yeah, day. Yeah. And like he, you hear and him, he's like, you see he's him like, hear it. Yeah. And it, he knows it's off for like half a second and dismisses it. Yeah. And he's like, I love you too. Bye. She's like, bye, sweetie. Bye. And he's like, you could see, like, if he wasn't leaving, he would ask her if everything yeah. was okay. And it's so it's very subtle and very effective. But in the original uh, write-up, she flat out confronts him and says, are you having an affair? And it's effective for a whole other reason, because it's really fucking uncomfortable, because neither of them want uh. to drop it. She, she's that waiting I in front of him, she's being like, I, going, I found this, I found this hair. And he goes, well, I got the suit cleaned, and she and she goes, she goes, you know, so you took your super suit to a dry cleaner. He's like, I told her it was for a costume party. It's the old lady who works at the dry cleaner. It's her hair, and she and you know, and she's like, it's blonde, it's white, it's platinum blonde. And then the worst part is then Bob just kind of sighs and he's like, just losing the. He's like, just new job. I just, I wanted the suit cleaned. I just wanted something from the past to look nice again. I just, I got the suit cleaned. And she feels legitimately bad, even though he's lying. And then you see him leave, and he looks really sad that he had to lie. 
And it's way it's way more intense. It's way less subtle. See, but my it's one gripe about intense. the first movie is that they never really touch upon that arc again of that mistaken uh like dramatic irony where like she thinks he's having an affair but he isn't and it still looks like he's having an affair even up to her rescuing him and they just kind of drop it there i I think that's the only uh well i think i think that's the payoff is uh mirage lets him go and he gives her a big hug and of course that's when she walks in so she punches her the fuck out yeah, I just I feel like there should have been something that showed that like a little something more, a little a quiet little moment yeah. where we have a conversation. Though I do where, love like, she gets that that isn't what's happening, like whether I, he tells her or not. Yeah, I I do think that that resolution. And I feel like if that mean, scene was in it, I would have felt that so much stronger. <laughs> if they had okay, that yeah. argument and then they still didn't touch upon it, like that would have been terrible. <laughs> yeah, yeah, like. That, that's the funny thing is because all the deleted scenes for Incredibles 1 have uh, added bits where Brad Bird and some other person are talking about it. And every single one, it's Brad Bird just being like, I'm really sad that we lost this bit, this bit, and this bit. But in the end, it was for the best. Mm-hmm. But man, I wish we kept this bit, this bit, and this bit. And it's like, they, they didn't give it a really uh, strong, like definitive resolution. But I do think that the little bit they gave gave me one of my favorite lines in the original movie, mm-hmm. which is when they're both running away and she's still fucking mad at him. And he's just like, you're trying to kick a fight, but I'm just happy you're alive. And I'm like, I love that. That's such a nice, like, real couple line. Mm-hmm. It's really good. But uh, that was, honestly, that's the thing that I like the most about Incredibles 2 is the, uh, the family dynamic. Because it felt like, for me, the strongest element, despite it being very much like an Elastigirl mm-hmm. movie, I think the whole thing with Bob and the kids was the best part of the movie for I me. I feel like that was that was where they put the heart of it. Um, yeah. Like, I was, I was so happy, because I was so worried that it was going to be like, okay, well, not only is the sequel going to be, it's similar to the first one, but the roles are reversed, but it's also going to be that fucking, like, Dad needs to change a diaper. Whoa, oh, he's in Yeah, I've heard so many people it's like, that were like on both sides of the spectrum of like, God, he's such a shitty dad, and like, God, he's such a perfect dad. Like, how could you hate him? And like, yeah. nah, he's kind of a selfish dude who can ultimately pick himself up and be a good dad when he needs to be. Yeah, he's got he's got flaws. I saw some people where they were like. They ruined his character. They they made him a misogynist. And it's like, no, they didn't. He's got flaws. But he at the end of the day, he puts them aside. He likes to be in the spotlight because that's what he's used to. But eventually they have that really wonderful scene where they're laying in bed talking to each other. And he's like, am I disappointed? I don't get to be a superhero. Yes. But also this is objectively better for our children. And I'm yeah. happy to support you. And then they turn it into like a friendly little like, and then you can watch me do it better. And she smacks him with the pillow. And it's like, they've got the ideal yeah. marriage. That's great. That's so good. That's not a Hollywood marriage. And That's also, a real watching both of the movies, uh, a thing that I think they never really touch upon with his character um, that I feel like they easily could is that, like, I think a part of his character is blaming himself for Supers going away at all. Specifically with the train yeah. incident and him being yeah, the start of the lawsuits. And then the the worst yeah. that he ever is, like, like, in that whole, like, selfish, the spotlight isn't on me thing, is when he's on the phone call after he's just fucking failed the whole day at being a dad. And she just had a great day where she successfully saved a train and is, like, the rise of yeah, the super is coming shit, back. That's great. That is the inverse of every problem that he I had, never even thought about like, that. with his life. And people are like, why does he get so that's mad? So and I'm like, that's why he that's gets the thing. so As mad. I saw people... <laughs> He's not even mad at her. He's mad that, like... Yeah, I, I've seen people being like... Being like, Mr. Incredible's a shitty person. He's such a stupid, sexist, you know, blowhard. And it's like, no. he's. It's natural to feel jealous. Or, you know, like, you want to be mm-hmm. in the spotlight. Especially if you're used to it. All it's What he's feeling is totally natural. It doesn't mean that it has to be positive. And it's like, I love his arc because it's, it's, it so easily could have been the like, oh, dad's got to cook 
breakfast. He's got to do women's work, you know? Mm -hmm. And it's like, it doesn't do that at all. It's like he gets handed, you know, the kids, Mm -hmm. which he's not used to being a stay at home parent. And also the baby is shooting laser beams and he's not used to it, but damn it. He tries. I have never seen a movie with this like Mr. Mom type scenario where on day one he goes, you know what? Fuck it. And he gets mm-hmm. up and he reads the entire math book. That to me was, that got me worked up. I was like, that's beautiful right there. This isn't, you know, oh, I'm stuck with the kids. This is someone who legitimately cares about his family. And yeah. you never see And they that easily could have like had this. him do like that stupid stuff and then still it's try to have dynamic. him like ultimately become a better dad. And it would have felt more hollow if that were the case. But because they have him yeah. like, he gets like a day where he doesn't know what he's doing. It's his first day. He jumps into it and he screws up. Uh, and he that's not even the first like or the last time that he screws up. He keeps going into it with Violet. <laughs> like he keeps messing up, but he's still trying. Yeah. He keeps trying to brute force things. He, he treats parenting like he treats superheroing. His power is that he's strong yeah. and invulnerable. So he's just going to run through the wall. So when his son has homework problems, his solution is, well, I'm going to stay mm-hmm. up all night and I'm going to brute my way through this textbook. But then when his son is like, well, now we're yeah. on a different thing, his answer is, ah, fuck. And then meanwhile, you have Helen, where her whole mm-hmm. thing is that she's flexible in every sense of the word. And she has trouble fighting a pizza guy. She has a fist fight with a pizza guy with a cattle prod and she almost loses and also an apartment building blows up. That's a situation mm. where Mr. Incredible would have had it handled in 30 seconds. I don't know if I agree with that one. <laughs> but then they both find their own ways of doing things. I, I think, at least in that specific scenario, she saves the train better than he saved the train with less collateral. Yeah, and also but, in the beginning, I feel like they make a very good point as to like why Helen is picked, where they're like, okay... Oh, you yeah. produce massive amounts of ice everywhere that do that does not unfreeze quickly, and yeah. you are built to destroy. And we're trying to have a nice, good, squeaky clean image. She can we take people down it. with minimal damage. Yeah, and probably the most humanely. <laughs> Even with like the the theming of all of the characters, with like in the first movie, everybody's base their powers are based off of everything. Um, with like him being like the the strong like head of the family and her being flexible. Yeah, that, you know, dad has to be strong, so he's super strong. Mom's got to stretch everywhere, so she's flexible. Yeah. Teens don't want to be seen; she's mm-hmm. invisible. Yeah, and I feel like everybody stays the same except for Violet. Uh, I saw a good description of how her power is, uh, even after she's become like the like more outgoing person who doesn't mind being seen in public. Um, yeah. In this one, her arc really changes in the third arc, or in like the third act, uh, where yeah. her powers uh, are invisibility and also shields because, like, in the past, she would put up walls. Now people are saying that she's the older sibling who wants to protect her uh, younger siblings. And that's what her power symbolizes now as she grows. And I think it's cool that like those yeah. powers can still symbolize different things as they grow up. I think that's an interesting thing to look at. Yeah. And I'm going to be honest, that that's the thing is I feel like they kind of shot themselves in the foot almost by revealing like, well, yeah, when we were designing mm-hmm. the characters, we took this into yeah. account, you know, Frozone is the cool uncle. So he shoots ice like shit like that. And then you look at like these new heroes and it's like, this is Screech. He's an owl. I'm like, and <laughs> does he have a character? No, really, but he's an owl. And it's like, I like those new characters because they were they made the action mm-hmm. more interesting. But fuck, man, they had nothing in terms of. I was going to say, Void got personality, and then I think the other ones were supposed to. She got a little bit. Look like a unit, so that you'd like forget. <laughs> Yeah, like, Void got a little something, but even then, her character was just kind of like, well, she's nice and insecure. And at the end of it, it's like, she's nice and less See, with her, I saw the purpose of her being, like, uh, showing what Elastigirl's arc means for the rest of their universe, 
is that like her going yeah. back into the spotlight yeah. and like being a superhero is what makes uh, all of these people more comfortable in addition to their kids uh, and kind of reminds her when she's not really comfortable with the corporate aspect of it that like this is what it's about. <laughs> Yeah, some emotional and she meets all these people, and I I think all the other people, uh, they didn't, they didn't have a strong narrative. Like, even Frozone's thing was he like he's the he's the cool uncle, so he's he's got freezing powers. Like it was that level of like, well, it kind of makes sense, but I think the purpose of them was that they were like very clearly supposed to be just give him powers, like. You look at them and you're like, oh yeah, none of those people really have many friends. They don't fit in with society. Um, mm-hmm. The bird guy's weird and eclectic. Uh, the brick lady is dumb as a brick. Like the other guy is too full of himself to really make connections with anyone. I forget the other ones. Uh, and then Void is clearly like yeah. shrinking Violet. Doesn't want to talk to anybody. Um, she's a quirky fan girl, and it's like, all right. I I wish they had less of those characters. If they had like maybe instead mm-hmm. instead of like five or six or however many there were, if there was like three, and each one got like a yeah, little something. I feel- not not they didn't need to be like the focus, but like in the way that everybody got an arc in Guardians of the Galaxy two. Ironically, Dash is the only one to notice like that one of them is missing. Uh, like he has a whole arc about oh, yeah. like learning math, and then at the very end, he's the only one who counted how many there were. <laughs> yeah, he's just oh, like, "Hey, wait, there's good. one more." His whole yeah. arc is learning the right time to hit a button. Uh, and no, his, his whole arc was like, "It's like that's all right." The very fifties, he got like the leave it to be the short uh, thing about like, "Oh man, Dad's car is so cool. I want Dad's car." Oh, God. oh gosh, Dad. I feel yeah. like that would have been like an arc to have if like they aged the characters up a bit. Mm. I feel like if like in the similar vein of like Violet being like, oh, she goes from like putting putting up walls around herself to being like the protective older sibling. Um, if for him they were like, oh, he's he is a hyperactive ten year old. Oh, he wants to grow up too fast. If they were to age him up. Uh, yeah. And he's very interested in like yeah, that, that getting the car and like he he just wants to be an adult already and he doesn't appreciate like a max goof kind of thing. Um, yeah, yeah, that could be good for that could be good for a sequel because that, that's the thing. While I was watching this, I guess it's not necessarily a bad thing. It's very much dependent on taste. Mm-hmm. But I felt like where whereas the first one, I would rank that as like it's an like it's an action movie. Yes. It is a it is a pulpy spy movie mm-hmm. that happens to be animated and aimed at children. Yeah. Or aimed at families rather. Mm-hmm. This one I feel is much more like like if it ended with a with a thing at the end of the credits like the Incredibles will be will return in their new series yeah. on Disney XD. Like I would totally buy that and I'd be like, okay, like this I this one felt a lot more three, but sure. Yeah, like th- this one felt a bit, a lot more like sanitized. Like this one felt a bit more like it was setting up for a uh, Big Hero Six style animated series or something. Whereas the first one was full of death and insecurity mm-hmm. and marital woes and sexual tension. I think that's just the problem of like being death. a sequel is that like it needs to expand, so it feels like when you go to a part two, it feels like the only where to, the only way to go is like to keep going. It yeah. feels like there will be a next installment like, when you have a second movie. Cause two, there's totally going to be an incredible yeah. story. But even the, if there this, this one has already made more money than the first yeah. one. It's it's they're getting a third mm-hmm. one out there. And it's like, all right, I hope they go for something a little bit more ambitious. I feel like it'll be easier. This, I think, this one felt a little safe. I think, Part twos are always the hardest of a trilogy to work on. <laughs> yeah. I feel like being being in the middle is never hard. like an easy spot to be in. The beginning is great. The end is like the beginning is easy. The end is easy. The middle is hard. And that's just yeah. writing. <laughs> yeah. Like, I don't know. There, there's a lot of stuff I really liked about it. 
I, I think the animation is mm-hmm. fucking amazing. I thought the action, the action is better than anything in the DCEU, like mm-hmm. hands down. Uh, and certain parts of the MCU, like, we're, we're, I would say. Yeah, we're we're at we're at the I point think you where might have already brought it up you can unironically review, say uh, just like how good they were at remembering like to put their powers into everything. Like these people live with them twenty four seven. Of course, they're going to be really good at using them for anything. Honestly, it kind of reminds me of th- this is going to be a bit of a reach for anybody not in the know, but it reminds me a little bit of uh, our weekly tabletop game with. Oh uh, yeah, I'm, six, I'm sure the seven, seven or eight people involved in that are gonna are gonna get it, and nobody else. Yeah, shout out shout out to you know most yeah. of our listening audience. Uh, but for any anybody not in the know, it's a D and D type thing with superheroes. But the whole deal is that. Everybody, because, you know, it has to be a balanced game, mm-hmm. nobody nobody gets to be Superman, you know, where it's like, I could fly, and I'm super strong and invulnerable, and yeah. I shoot lasers. No, you get, like, two mm-hmm. or three powers max. So everything you do has to involve those powers somehow, and that's a lot yeah. of how The Incredibles is set up. Like, Mr. Incredible, he's strong and invulnerable. Yep. That's all he gets. He still has, when it comes to, you know, if he has to run down the street, he mm-hmm. still has to do cardio, because biologically, in that regard, he's like yeah. a fifty-year-old dad. It's like Elastigirl; like she could stretch, so that can help her, you know, be more agile. But she's not able to pick up a car mm. just because she's a superhero. You know, people. Th- that was a big detail that they also cut. Go back to the uh, deleted scenes from the first one. Uh, the plane was originally going to be flown yeah. by a guy. That's the other thing that I uh, remember. This, this guy, this guy, Snug, who she, mm-hmm. yeah, who she calls up to get the plane. The idea behind him was that back in the olden days, if you were a superhero who couldn't fly, you needed to be able to get to your mission. Mm-hmm. And this is the guy who would take people there. So there is a designated superhero transporter. Yeah, he was going like, to be that's like a pretty like cool another concept Edna because, Mode yeah. person. Like, he's the guy you go to for us. Yeah. And he, he was going to... He was going to mm-hmm. fucking die in that airplane, and they were like, that'd be a little bit much, considering that technically it's Violet's fault that the plane blew yeah, up. Yeah, you don't want to put that on so a that'd kid. that'd be a little too heavy. <laughs> Even a fictional one. Yeah, but, uh... But, yeah, there's a lot of stuff in... There's a lot of stuff in Incredibles 2 that I really, really love. Uh, one thing I really didn't love See, was the villain. I don't like that it was the same Disney thing as always, where it was like... A twist villain. I did like so how it seemed tired. like it was the reverse I'm of so the usual Disney formula, where you went in like, okay, I know who the villains are going to be, and then the twist was that like her brother wasn't in on it. To me, <laughs> that was a, that was a decent part. I liked that element of the twist, and that the brother is legitimately yeah. a good guy. He's and just like, sort there's of multiple eyed. points. Uh, I happened uh, to see the movie twice. There's there's multiple points that I noticed on the second rewatch. Where it mm. deliberately like seems to be setting up that he's the villain and she might be involved, but that he's the mastermind. That's that's the thing, is I walked into the theater, mm-hmm. like I knew the main characters that they were introducing. You know, I knew like, oh, Bob Odenkirk is in it as this guy. I immediately knew that she was gonna be the villain I mean, because yeah. her name is Evil Endeavor. Mm-hmm. Her name is literally Evil Endeavor. And I was like, okay, so that's the villain. But then, as I watched the movie, I was like, well, wait a minute. What mm-hmm. if that's uh, a red herring? You know, what if, what if they named her something so stupid and so obvious? Because, like, mm-hmm. the, the original Incredibles had, you know, yeah. wordplay. You know, No Manasen Island and all that. And it's like, okay, well, maybe they named her something that stupid and noticeable to mm-hmm. distract away from... Bob Odenkirk. Maybe the twist isn't going to be surprised. The obvious person is the villain mm-hmm. who isn't obvious. Like maybe it's a twist on a twist, you know, maybe they know that we're expecting a twist. Therefore we expect it to be the sister who the movie is not setting up to be the villain, but then the twist is going to be that it is the guy that we would expect the movie to set up <laughs> as the villain. If we were, I, f- I feel like you just went too many times around the spiral right? staircase for this one. So maybe this movie's actually fucking brilliant if it's making me think like this. So, and I, w- I was thinking like, okay, mm-hmm. it's like they introduce her in her first scene. 
they introduce her as like, oh yeah, she's the one that does all the machines, you know? And it's like, she's the one that does the technology. I just bankroll everything. And I'm like, okay, well that's, yeah. when has that character not been a villain, you know? Like when, when has, I'm the face and the money, but this is my, you know, more yeah. uh, sarcastic uh, partner in the situation who does See, all the technology. I, I like when have they not going been in that villain? she would be like, I don't think like, okay, maybe like she was basically going to be the mirage and he was going to be like the setup syndrome. And a couple times they, right. they hint that it's actually him. Uh, they have the thing where like they're in the van, like looking at the technology when she goes to, uh, when she figures it out, they have that long sequence where like, she's going to put the tracker on the satellite and then she's going to find him. Um, and when they're first talking about it, when they're just like sitting there at the yes. party and having drinks, um, Mrs. Incredible goes, I know how to get him. And then Evelyn goes, Winston? And she goes, Winston? No, uh, Screen Slaver. Uh, and I was like, mm hmm. Uh, and then later, when she's doing the thing, uh, right, right. And they like, they do the broadcast again, and it goes out, and she's following the, the signal. They have like Winston sitting over Evelyn, like really, uh, domineeringly with like an evilish look on his face and like lit only by like the monitor screens and he's like wow your tech worked let's see if she finds yeah. it and like you're like does he does he know that that like i don't think they had that conversation does he know where she's going um and then it looked like both of them were in on it uh and then it kept going and i don't think i saw anything else with that but like for the rest of the movie until they revealed that it was just her I was like, oh, it's clearly him. <laughs> like, that's what we're setting it up to be. And then it wasn't. There, there was a moment where I was thinking, okay, maybe they're trying to throw us for a loop by naming her Evil Endeavor. And maybe the joke is going, or not the joke, the twist is going mm -hmm. to be, he's been orchestrating the screen slaver thing as part of his PR yeah. and didn't tell her because maybe he's not evil. He's just deluded, you know, mm -hmm. yeah. like he's, he's the kind of like, I'm putting on a show and it needs to look good. You know, like he's one of those. And then it's, no, she's just, she's the villain. And I was like, mm -hmm. oh. And it was, a, it was a really flaccid reveal. Which, I mean, compared to mm -hmm. someone like Syndrome, who is probably the best performance in Incredibles 1. And has he does. And that was also so much depth and emotional intensity to him. And also his, also his, uh, his plan is so much more mm. complex and interesting. And that is his whole deal is he's going to basically play superhero. And then when he gets too old to put on the rocket boots, say, ah, fuck it. I'm going to be Steve jobs now and make everybody super. So that superheroes become an obsolete concept. And then you have this one where it's like, I'm going to hypnotize people See, into ruining this like, legislation so things will stay the way they are. I feel like, like even after she's revealed, it still seems right. like it was originally That's the plan for Winston to be the like, villain. Because mm -hmm. like, the way that she says it is like, oh, I'm going to do this in a way to create bad PR for you. Yeah. And that seems like his, his whole bag. Like If it was just him the whole time creating bad PR for Supers, he's the one that runs the PR. That would have been perfect. Yeah, like... Or it, it would have been neat, at least, if they mm -hmm. even had a scene where they were like, they were like, I figured it out, it's Winston, and they go to confront him, and that's where the twist happens. Like, that would be interesting yeah. to at least entertain the idea that it's a twist, but instead it's just sort of like, eh, it's out there. And it's like, eh, all right. Yeah. All right, you know, you know, like, it, it serves its purpose. And that's kind of that's how I felt with a lot of the stuff that I wasn't really hot on in this movie. Is like that's fine. Like I think Brad Bird himself even described this as like, yeah, it's basically a popcorn movie. He's like, it's it's my version of a popcorn movie, and it's like that's still better than like ninety percent of popcorn movies. But man, I feel I feel break like a sweat on the next one, you know. Ending it like if it were to be a trilogy, I feel like ending it off right there would be like. It's it's easier to stick the landing than to than to be midair right yeah, now. Yeah, like if if they ended it right now, I see them like it's going to have an animated series. It's definitely going to have an animated series. It's doing really good numbers at the box office and see I've seen stuff on Twitter that implies that at least Brad Bird isn't 
interested in the idea or at least he's jokey about it like um, that's the thing if it, it feels too perfect like it's like it, yeah like, how does it, i think it should yeah like how how does it end oh well now superheroes are legal and there are tons of new superheroes coming out of the woodwork and also the underminer got away it's like well there's mm-hmm. your cast supporting cast and potentially a villain that could tie it into the movie there's your first tv good, special l- good luck TV. john ratzenberger yeah right like, because John Ratzenberger doesn't do anything aside from the Pixar movies. It's like, so you could get him easily. Violent I mean, does Disaster. Have to? Eh, you'd want to get him. You, you, you know what it would be? He's good. You, know like, you know what You know it would be? I have not heard a good John Ratzenberger impression is the thing. That's fair. What, what I think it would be is because Dash and Violet's voice actors, they'll do anything. They're in the Lego game. They're the, they're mm-hmm. the only, them and I think John Ratzenberger are the only real voices from the movie in the Lego version of the game. And they also do, like, commercials and stuff. So it's like, okay, you can get replacements for Helen Hunt and Craig T. Nelson. Whatever, no problem. Mm-hmm. And then, or wait, is it Helen Hunt? I don't think so. Or is it Bonnie Hunt? I, I always get it confused. Hang on. Um, but there Holly, is a different... Holly Hunter. There you I go. I got it all messed up. Holly Hunter. You could get a replacement for Craig T. Nelson and Holly Hunter. You can get mm-hmm. the actual kids... And have be, you know, hour long series premiere where they go get the underminer and it's like, there you go. You can I probably mean, get some a, there was a um what do you call it? A comic series that was something similar. I I heard those are really good. I want to look those up. Uh, apparently they are they are excellent. Yeah, it's it's interesting the the direction that they chose to go in those. Yeah. And like uh freaking what's his name? Um uh, Reflux was voiced by Colonel Campbell, so you could get him for the TV show. Like, and uh, the two of the other guys were both Phil Lamar doing double duty. Actually, for uh, Elastigirl, not not to fan cast here, but I think Amy Sedaris would be a pretty good. Uh... Yeah, that could work. Yeah, that could totally work. Which, by the way, she's in My Life as a Zucchini. <laughs> hey, bring it full circle. But yeah, Incredibles two, I liked it. I didn't love it. Uh, I loved it, <laughs> but I, 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 I loved parts of it. I think that it's it's kind of like what I said in my blog post about it. Like, it feels like it's not Brad Bird's best effort, but not Brad Bird's best effort is still yeah. something really, really good. Like, I, I wouldn't rank it near like the top of Pixar, the Pixar stack. I think I think a big thing for it for me is. As far as I'm concerned, like Incredibles is the best Pixar movie. I think I'd put in my it on, ranking. Like Incredibles if you're just purely one. ranking Pixar sequels, uh, I'd put it right below the Toy Stories. Like number yeah. three. You know what? Yeah, I would I would say that. Yeah, if if it's just the sequels, yeah. this is you the you can fight over whether Toy Story two or Toy Story there. three is the better of the sequels. I know people do that all the time. Uh, they both got good stuff. They both got good stuff. Um, I, like, I honestly can't say which one I like more. I don't know. I, I, I like both of them for different reasons. Uh, I think yeah. I think I would get like, it to Toy Story 2 if only because making... Uh, I'm always going to say making the second part of a trilogy is the hardest part, and it was really good. Until it's yeah. not going to be a trilogy anymore. Yeah. It's actually a tetralogy. I should, re- I should re-watch before? those. I haven't watched those in a while. Yeah, I, yes it is. I think so. Is Tetris. Yeah. And uh, that's the thing. Apparently, uh, I had actually heard apparently this one was put on the fast track because mm. Toy Story 4 is having some issues. Apparently, Toy Story 4, they have like thrown out more than half the script and like. Oh, dang. Changed directors and Insider writers gossip. and ev- everything is a mess with it and they bumped it back like a full year. And. Yeah, apparently Toy Story 4 is in some dire states, which is why they moved Incredibles up a little bit. Mm. And that, that kind of seems why parts of it feel a bit like it's a conceptual mm. draft. Like, it, it feels like there's some kinks they didn't get to iron out with this one, which I guess makes sense. Yeah. Considering I heard that Brad Bird was working on the first Incredibles for, like, even longer than he was apparently working on this one. That makes like, sense. Like, apparently, apparently Incredibles 1 was originally going to be 2D animated and released in, like, the mid-90s, and he was just sitting on that idea until, like, a bunch of Pixar people Could you were imagine like, hey, how pretty that movie would have been? Oh, my God, with that Art Deco style? Holy shit. 
it'd have been it'd have been something to behold. I mean, we'll see but... it if they ever make a show. Because yeah, yeah. It's uh, a, honestly, our budgets have caught properties. up pretty well. This sort of probably translate yeah. best to two D. Yeah. <laughs> but uh, hell, honestly, this one would work fucking brilliantly as a series. Mm-hmm. It's a superhero show, but uh, yeah, no, Incredibles two, good movie. Maybe not what I wanted it to be, but definitely not bad or disappointing. Mm-hmm. Just w- wish they did some stuff differently. Yeah, Incredibles three when? Yeah, and then uh, coming soon. Okay, so yeah, coming soon. Some movies we got coming out uh, next month, or I guess this month really mm-hmm. in July. Um, not a lot that I'm interested in. I'm gonna be I'm gonna be honest. Ant Man two. Ant Man and the Wasp. Uh, looks I think fun. if I go and see it, I'll like it as much as I liked Ant Man, which is yeah, it's fun, fun time. Fine, sure. Yeah, yeah. No, Ant Man and the Wasp should be a fine time. That'll be a a good time at the at the Ant- cinema. I'm gonna re-record that because I knocked my desk and it banged a bunch <laughs> of shit all over. Uh, but yeah, Fourth of July weekend, Ant Man two should be yeah. you know should be fine. And then we got a bunch of shit that I don't really care about. You got, I care about some of it. <laughs> do, you, do you care about Hotel Transylvania three? I wish they didn't spoil the entire plot in the trailer. Yeah, it's got. That's I my like. Review. I like the animation. The animation is fucking gorgeous. Thanks, Gendy. I wish you were making Popeye, and I'm sure you do too. Uh, we all wish she was making Popeye. Everybody wants the the Gendy Popeye. Mm-hmm. I mean, then we got. Uh, another Mission Impossible. Can you believe I've never seen one of those? Uh, no, but I haven't either, and I feel like that's uh, a drink and do a marathon thing. That sounds like a good time. Yeah. Apparently, these movies are actually all really good. Apparently. I also heard that. I heard that. I know Brad Bird did a couple of them. So hey, really? quality right there. Huh. Uh, we got Skyscraper, which I can't believe is coming out now. I thought this came out like years ago. Oh, is this? I remember the thing seeing with, a trailer uh, for this. Yeah, like, is this the thing with Dwayne the Rock Johnson on the skyscraper. This is where the ro- yeah, this is where the Rock fights a burning building. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. No, I I heard about this one. It's he's he's got a prosthetic leg and it's Die Hard, except it's the Rock, and also I think they're in China. It's it's a China movie. Okay. Which to clar which to clarify is so it doesn't sound horribly uh-huh. racist. China is one of the grow- biggest growing movie markets nowadays, so frequently you'll see big dumb action movies that really, really cater to China, mm. because that's the kind of thing that the Chinese movie market really, really loves. So that's why like Iron Man 3 had an entire like 20-minute segment filmed where it's just Ch- Tony Stark goes to China for a little bit, and you didn't find that in the American version. But the Chinese version of Iron Man 3 has exclusive scenes where Iron Man like goes and hangs out in China that's... for a little bit interesting yeah and like all of the transformers movies have like an action sequence in like shanghai or whatever now because they really really like movies with explosions and big robots and basically special effects that american movies can pay for so and that's the stuff like the meg for example the meg is like a chinese co-production where it's set in china because that will ensure that it does really really well Mm. when it comes out in china but yeah, it's it's an that. interesting uh, interesting market strategy that has gotten really fucking huge for anyone who is not aware and thought that I was just angry going at it. It's a fucking Chinese I mean, movie. Sure, the base level anger, maybe, but <laughs> mostly <laughs> confusion. Dwayne yeah, the Rock Johnson is like, not Chinese. Typically not, a, <laughs> typically not uh, an indicator of quality, but hey, uh, could be a fun drunk watch. Uh, we got Mamma Mia 2, you know, in case your mom wants to go out for a free weekend. Uh, I think you mean in case uh, I want to go out for a free weekend. By the way, Mamma Mia number seen one, Mama Mia. Uh, I have seen Mamma Mia the musical, like, on Broadway when I was a kid. Uh, okay. My mom took me, and I loved it. It was my introduction to ABBA. <laughs> <laughs> oh, no. Yeah, which, like... My introduction to ABBA was ABBA. <laughs> I mean, I wish it was that, uh, but it wasn't, and I'm glad that I was introduced to ABBA at all. Um, but yeah, so I'm totally fine for just like a, a wine country chick flick movie. Um, 
<laughs> that's a that's a good fucking term. It's a wine country chick flick. That is scored a very specific Abba. subgenre, I've watched but a subgenre worse genre movies because they were scored by a certain band or musician, um, and they still brought me joy. Have you seen Romeo and Juliet? Because you should. It's a fun time. I have. And you know what? You've sold me on Mamma Mia 2. Uh, Here just we don't go expect again. Uh, former James Bond actor Pierce Brosnan to be a good singer because that is the most common joke about that movie. Oh, that's. I hope we get more footage of him singing because it's will. the most embarrassing thing I've ever you fucking will. seen. It's like, it's it's almost as good as Russell Crowe also, in Les Mis. It's almost I, that I don't good. know if you have this uh, a lot. I'm very interested in seeing, like, the meta narrative of how narratives uh, like advance. Like I like the concept of making okay. the movie of a musical and then giving that like adaptation of a different thing that didn't have a sequel, a sequel. I think that is so interesting to like. Oh, like, like how with Jurassic Park was an adaptation of a yeah. book and then they made, they said this made a lot of money. So we need a sequel. So the studio paid Michael Crichton to write a book and then they gave the book to Steven Spielberg and he went, I'm not using that shit. And he basically wrote his own yes. fan fiction and released it as a movie. And now we're yeah, on Jurassic Park I think Park it's so five. interesting when things do that, when they just morph and then grow from this like separate appendage. Like when you cut down like the trunk of a tree and then it starts, it like one of the branches just takes over and fucking keeps going because fuck you. <laughs> I think that is so <laughs> neat. <laughs> it's going to make it. It's definitely an interesting phenomenon. Mm -hmm. And then we have Unfriended the Dark Web. The Dark Web. Uh, which... The, the internet is scary. Do you know anything about the first Unfriended? Um, I remember seeing trailers for it and hearing... This is shot in a pretty interesting way, but it's still, you know, a dumb, schlocky, like, Bloomhouse-type horror movie. Yeah, there you go. Um, yeah. yeah, it's shot in an interesting way in that everything, uh, the whole movie... Uh, essentially takes place uh, on the screen. Uh, yeah, Skype. on the screen of somebody's laptop. So you see like all the websites that they go to and it's not poorly researched actually. Like they, there's like videos of like things that can't be shown on YouTube, like suicides and stuff like that. Uh, and they're on like a real different website that would host that because they don't take those things down. Right. Like, they're on. They're on Vimeo. Uh, I, I forget what it's called. They're on Daily I Motion. I forget what the fuck it was on, but it, it was it was something tube uh, that isn't YouTube. Um, maybe I don't fucking know. Um, but yeah, so it's it's like it's real like actual like research. Where would you go for this thing? This stuff actually exists, uh, kind of thing. And I'm interested to see how Unfriended the Dark Web handles that. Are they going to be as accurate with that? Uh, I mean, obviously not to the extent given the premise uh, one would hope, but <laughs> I think it's interesting that in the other one, yeah. it was a completely paranormal uh, like thing. It was like, this girl committed suicide. Uh, she committed suicide due to bullying. Ghost, All the bullies are in a Skype call she's about to fuck them all up for what they did. Uh, yeah. And then, whereas this one is more like... I, rem I remember I found the uh, trailer because I was mm -hmm. waiting for a YouTube video to load and it started playing this trailer and I was too taken with how stupid it looks to hit the skip ad button. Uh, where they find... One guy mm -hmm. like finds a laptop and he's like, yo... There's some there's some dark web things on here. There's illegal memes on this computer, and then some hooded cloaks like hack into their Skype call, and they're like, "Don't you've taken my computer? Don't go to the police." And then they appear behind a girl mm -hmm. and like strangle her with piano wire. It looks uh, very I'm silly. Interested to see how if the other one was completely paranormal, this one seems completely mundane. <laughs> Yeah, admittedly, maybe it's just because I'm, like, the biggest advocate mm -hmm. for anthology horror. Like, I want to start a no non-profit, like, save the anthology See, I like horror. when it's, it's an melted. Species. Like, I like fucking Trick or Treat, where it's like, all this stuff 
it works it works in its that own right too. and it also works together works it's too. in the same universe doesn't necessarily have to touch each other but there's little glimpses where you're like oh, okay this is this is that too this is all i have a greater context for it uh i'd like to see another big successful franchise mm-hmm. do what halloween failed to do because halloween was originally going to be a different story each movie yeah but all the stories took place on halloween and they fucked that up by making Halloween 2 about Michael Myers again. So that when Halloween 3 was like, okay, new story yeah. time, everybody said, what the fuck is this? And now it can only ever be Michael Myers, which I think we, we got that trailer too. Uh, and this seems more like Halloween a, a direct sequel it's where like, they yep. were like, okay, we recognize that we couldn't do that. Our biggest mistake was trying was trying to like decide know, uh, to do both at different times. So this one you can watch as if it was a direct sequel to the yeah. original Halloween and none of the other stuff ever happened. I know uh, I know James Rolfe made a really good video where it was like chronologically confused about Halloween. And uh, it's it's a very fun little video <laughs> that's also pretty informative. I'll link that in the description as right. well. But um, uh, I would like I would kinda like it if Enfrented the Dark Web was it's just, a completely different yeah. thing, but then if it became a franchise where the only connecting thread is it takes place through mm-hmm. a webcam like that, that'd, I think be, that'd pretty be pretty cool. cool. I, I think might it not, would be just as cool if it I might was not like, see it, but it'd be pretty cool. See, I'm interested because that's what it looks like. It is. I'm interested in if it isn't that like, if it is actually yeah. paranormal again, no, well not neat. necessarily even paranormal, but like going further than that, uh, I've seen a lot of theories that were like, okay, so the first one, um, this girl uh, committed suicide and became a vengeful ghost uh, because she was bullied via the internet through various means, and so she ironically kills her, uh, in her opinion, murderers through... Bullies. Yeah, it's she, she gets revenge yeah. on these people uh, through the internet, in, a, in an ironic sense. Um, darkly ironic. Uh, and I think there, there are yeah. some theories that I thought were cool about like what if that's who she is now is somebody who like if you use the internet oh, uh, what for if she, ill what if she's like the what if she's like the candy man of cyberbullying now yeah what if, what if like in this one she's now coming to these kids aid uh against the other people who have used the internet to wrong people uh and then she shows up in this movie and that's why it's a sequel um that could be interesting uh yeah and it could be interesting they could easily fuck it up uh i really don't care which one it is i think i think it would be interesting uh in the same way that i would think it would be interesting if i just read about it on wikipedia and i was like huh yeah okay neat huh yeah yeah. um rather than it's one of those uh If if you're listening to this in eighth grade uh take your crush to see it it'll be a great time uh Speaking of eighth grade, <laughs> I didn't even attempt to make that segue. Really? Because I fuck, stayed I'm silent because I thought that's what you were doing. <laughs> God damn, I'm good at this. I'm too good for myself. Uh-huh. Uh, we got eighth grade, which is uh, Bo Burnham's uh, dramedy, looks like. Yeah, this is one of the ones up. that I'm actually uh, genuinely excited to see. I really can't wait to see this. It looks really, really good. I've been trying to uh, find it out here in LA where you would think I would be able to find it if not anywhere else in the country given its limited release yeah. uh, and I have and it's like a 45 minute drive away which is like two miles yeah. in LA given traffic uh, <laughs> so I might I yeah. might see it soon I might be able to to get down there uh, hopefully if I do you will definitely hear about it in the next podcast Otherwise, get ready for uh, a wombo combo of Mamma Mia and Mamma Mia 2, because that's definitely happening and you can't stop me. <laughs> yeah, no, 8th grade looks really, really cool. Uh, I like Bo Burnham, mm-hmm. and this, I think the thing that interests me so much is this does not look like something that's in his usual style yeah. of comedy. Uh, it's very. It's, it, it strikes me as very reserved. A lot of and, his stuff is... Uh, introspective and specifically geared toward him toward himself this is the first thing where the camera isn't pointed at him and i think that's interesting yes yeah it just just from the trailer i know when i had uh when i had adam and jake on i want to say that was episode three Mm -hmm. i think 
uh, we talked we talked about the trailer for this because that's when it had right. come out, and we we ended up talking about it for like a good 10, 15 minutes, just picking out like, oh, this shot in the trailer. I remember in a, a moment exactly like this, you know, the bit at the end where she's nervous to go up to karaoke. It's like I had that exact mm-hmm. same, you know, anxiety before high school yeah. and stuff like that. It seems like it's going to be a movie with a lot of real yeah. moments in it. And I'm very excited because I love movies. And I also enjoy like the that. realism of like it. Like a, a really hyper specific. Like in in yeah. other things you would uh... – you would you would see it like they they do that, but normally it would it would very much come across like this is a kid in like the modern day uh, presenting this what a the adult kid. that wrote it and remembers it being, which is not quite what it was. Yes. This seems very much like yeah modern today. This is what kids are going through right now, kind of thing. And maybe it isn't. I don't know. I'm not a, a child in this era, um, but. Yeah. It feels more realistic than uh, other attempts that I've seen, and I think that that's interesting. Yeah, definitely. It's uh, I've got high hopes for that one, to say the least. And in addition to that, we got another movie coming out uh, near the end of this month that looks better than it has any right to be, and that is Teen, Teen Titans, Titans Go, to, Go the to the Movies, which seems like it's banking on all of the things that are the best part of Teen Titans Go, uh, in my opinion, which are like... Uh, Teen Titans Go, once you get past, like, yeah, oh, which, they didn't revive Teen Titans, Teen people, Titans Go is so fucking great. stupid and entitled it's, about it's that should, and think that they deserve the... Uh, like the... The continuation, the next season... Yeah, closure. like it's it's not up to you, and yet yeah, sucks that it didn't continue, and it should have. But this has nothing to do with that. Like yeah. you, you don't this own didn't, this, this didn't series. The slot. It, that's the thing, honestly. Like if Teen Titans Go wasn't like literally the only thing they air on Cartoon Network nowadays, this shit mm-hmm. should be on Adult Swim. Like it's, I, I'll keep it on in the background sometimes. There's some really funny bits. There's some really stupid bits. But then you mm-hmm. also get bits where you look in the background and there's just an urn that says Robin 2. Yeah, with like a crowbar sitting next to it. Yeah, th- there's an entire episode where Robin is going, wait a minute, guys, we're superheroes. We need to we need to do a mission. And they're like, mission to get pizza. And he's like, no, like to fight a supervillain. And they end up breaking into like a, an evil facility. And he's like, we need to get past that guard. Beast Boy, take him out. And then cue like an eight minute long montage of Beast Boy seducing this guard and taking him out for like a candlelit dinner. Jesus. And it's like, it's like, what the fuck am I watching? I don't know, but I like it. It's really stupid in all the right ways. And there's so much fun stuff to find in this trailer. There's a bit where they're in the movie uh, in the back lot. And they're looking yeah, at all they're the like movie actually posters. on the lot at Warner Brothers. Yeah, they're, they're in the, the Warner lot Brothers back into, lot. And like that's that's literally the lot. <laughs> and they're they're looking at all of the movie posters, and one of them is like Detective Chimp and the Mystery of the Missing Mustache. And like yeah, it 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 gets it. I love Warner Brother. Warner Brothers strategy now seems to be make shitty live action movies and then make good animated films that make fun of the shitty live action movies and thus endear them more to people. Cause it already worked with Lego Batman mm-hmm. and it looks like it's going to work again with this. And I also like this movie shitting on like, th- there's a very specific line that shits on something that is very specific that I have hated literally for like decades at this point. And it's a bit where at the very end where I'm assuming this is during the climax Mm -hmm. of the movie and you've got Deathstroke in a big mech and he's going, you know, like, what are you going to do to me? What are are you going to fart on me? Are you going to challenge me to a dance battle? Are you going to annoy me with your lay epic waffles? And I'm like, I don't know what it is about waffles specifically, Mm -hmm. but it's such a like 2006 hot topic thing. That I feel was only exasperated in recent years by stuff yes. like Adventure Time. Where to be like, it's it's the epic waffle muffin amulet of mm-hmm. awesome. And you see that shit all, all over the place nowadays. And I'm like, finally, not only is it a movie taking this down a peg, it's fucking Teen Titans Go. Also, I'm pretty sure they're taking themselves Good. down a peg because I think that's a running joke from the show. Oh, yeah. 
That's the, is, oh, is it that they always make fun of? No, the, like the, they. Uh, I waffles? think that's genuinely a part of the show. Is the is the like fucking waffle dance thing? Pretty pretty sure that's an established thing in it. Well, yeah. Uh, oh, yeah. Because that, that's the thing. Wasn't that a bit from like the original Teen Titans show? It was like Evil Beware. We have waffles. Because I remember seeing that shirt in Hot Possibly? Topic since like the dawn of time. Where it's got like it's got like a chibi raven holding a waffle, and it's got like bold. It might have just been like fonts. really early Teen Titans Go. It's like we have waffles. Oh man, uh, no! I, I swear this was, was part a of thing like the first like, the episode was of, the, of the new show. New in air quotes. I, I think that that might have been why know. they brought it back. Like, oh yeah, no, I I just googled. Oh, it. is it's it totally from the sure. original show? This, this is just further proof. Yeah. I got to rewatch that show. Oh, hang on. You, this is going to be. I'm posting a link in the Zencaster chat right now to an image. I feel like this is going to be like. Uh, this is going to be like a sleeper word for like a Russian agent. You're going to see this and you're going to like Jesus. wake the fuck up and come into a completely different oh, realm of consciousness. Because even... this is. Uh, no, oh, I got it. Hang on. I got it. Wait it's going. It's going. It's going. I got to I got to scroll oh, along this entire one line of text just... for this whole thi- Oh, wait. No, never mind. I'm not I'm not going to bother oh, with that cuz that is uh That is a long thing. Hang on. Oh, good. It's being sold at Walmart here. Here's the actual link. Oh, here we go. To the page where you can buy one for your very own. And I'll put the image up on the screen. Aha. Uh-huh. This this fucking shirt at like at like every I anime club I honestly don't meeting, remember this shirt, but it looks at like every something poetry club meeting. I I have seen this shirt everywhere through middle middle school through high school. I saw that shirt everywhere. It is it is the default anime club shirt when I think Jesus. of like an anime club in middle school or high school. I think of that shirt. <laughs> I don't know what it is, but that shirt that shirt's like my white whale. It took my leg years years ago, and now I'm watching a Hollywood movie take it down a peg specifically, and I'm like, yes, yes, I like that. But uh, yeah, and mm-hmm. then you got just fun stuff like how Patton Oswalt voices the Atom, and UK voices I, I Superman. Enjoy- it's I like, enjoy fun. that the general thing. It, it looks that like a show, fun not to go tangent movie. separate from the movie, but I'm going on a tangent separate from the movie. Uh, I enjoy the thing with that show was that it got a lot of criticism from a lot of people, uh, being like, "This and isn't the Teen Titans that. I remember. This is childish and like dumb, and it doesn't have the drama that it did." Uh, and their response was just, "Yeah, <laughs> you want to see stupid? Mm-hmm. Like if you compare." original Teen Titans Go, like the shorts that were on that DC Nation block, it's like, okay, this is just original Teen Titans, but like a little bit more comedic. Right. And like, basically the equivalent of like the the music video segments they would do, like when they're chasing Mad Mod around. Like, that's the short. And if you compare that to like the most recent one, it's like, guys, look out. Cyborg is, uh, is a dog now, and here is a realistic photo of a beaver that is screaming like a man as we ride a slice of pizza to Saturn. And that's the episode. And it's like, it's it's gone full, like, Tim and Eric at this point. It is just, it crawled up its own ass in the best kind of yeah. way. It was like, oh, you don't like it's that? Great. You mean you're going to stop, like, wanting to see this? If we do this, okay, great, fantastic. That's what it's we're like, doing. It's now. like goodbye. It's like somebody went to a buffet and started eating shrimp, and they were like, "Wait, stop! You're allergic to shrimp." And they went, "Oh yeah!" And they crammed the entire tray of shrimp into their mouth, and they're just laying on the floor, seizing and expelling goo. That's what the show is now. It's just a big pile of everything. <laughs> And if you can't appreciate it just for that. I'm glad that their response to like, this is childish and dumb was, yeah, it's for kids and you're not one. And that's what you're really mad about is that you're not a kid anymore. Nothing we could have made would have satisfied you. It's a, it's an interesting uh, relationship. Teen Titans go has with Mm -hmm. humanity. 
But uh, yeah, I can't necessarily say that I will go out of my way to see this in the theater, but I'll definitely watch right. it at some point because it looks like a lot of fun. It, it looks like a lot of uh, lighthearted, goofy fun. Mm-hmm. And you know what? Sometimes you, you need that. Sometimes you yeah. just want to sit back and watch Captain Underpants. Yeah. So, yeah, not a lot. Yeah, not a lot coming out in July for some reason. I mean, a lot, but not a lot. Yeah, looking yeah, forward that's to. Interesting. I mean, we, we I guess Ant Man two, and then more importantly, Mamma Mia two in eighth grade. <laughs> you laugh, oh, yeah, but yeah, I'm yeah, serious. I keep, I keep forgetting about eighth grade. Eighth grade does look really good. Hopefully, there is a showing mm-hmm. uh, around me. Hope, hopefully, it's not a redux of I Love Dogs where. They dangled that shit in front of us and then yanked it away, and then surprise, nobody went and saw it. See, I saw but, I Love uh, Dogs, and I loved it. A lot of people I know saw I Love Dogs. Well, not a lot, but a couple of people I saw went out of their way to see it, and they said they loved it, and I was like, that's great. But... I still couldn't see it, so... Yeah, yeah. that's that's the main issue, is like, it's a good movie. If you're listening... Wish I could see it. Whoever, whoever is distributing 8th grade, Bo Burnham... <laughs> Make it make it a wide release, and you'll make lots of fucking money because it's made by Bo Burnham, and literally every single person I've ever talked to brings up Bo Burnham as like an icebreaker. Like everybody Who do you talk to, uh, mostly people, mostly grad students. Oh yeah, there you go. Yeah, they'll bring up like it'll be like, oh, so I was watching this Bo Burnham special, and the answer is always, oh, I love Bo Burnham from everybody, no matter who they're talking to. Mm-hmm. Like. It's it's made by Bo Burnham. He's probably not necessarily the biggest comedian, but he's the biggest young people comedian that's actually good. Yeah. Out there right now, if you slap his name on the marquee, you will get ticket sales. See, I think Trust the main me. problem with that is that, like, they tried that with his TV show and it didn't work. <laughs> he had a TV show? He did. It was called Zack Stone is Gonna Be Famous. But it's very much well, like fuck. his younger stuff that he's, like, ashamed of now. Mm-hmm. That, that makes sense. Bo Burnham strikes me as the kind of guy who has a lot of embarrassing younger stuff. Yeah, he's like, my first, like, special or two, like, the Comedy Central one, don't watch those things. Everything after that, I, I'm fine with. But, like, that stuff, I I was being, <laughs> it, it was more like shock value without a point. Uh, and the, sh- the show mm-hmm. does have an overarching point, um, which is essentially, like, fame bad. <laughs> Yeah. yeah. Yeah, and trying to achieve it, yeah, more often than not, will turn you into a bad person, <laughs> or at least someone who's well, hollow right. in the feeling that they're trying to get from fame. Yeah. So yeah. So on that happy note. Okay, so maybe don't put Bob Burnham's <laughs> name on it, because <laughs> I have literally never heard mm-hmm. of that up till now. But you know what, what I have heard of best boys which this has yes it has we're getting good at this ending shit uh if you want to find any of the stuff that we do uh chris what was your what was your twitter once again in case anybody forget it and also they're incapable of reading the description at chris underscore costi capital Uh, c's on twitter go for it get at it uh yeah if you want to find my stuff uh at the Jurassic Mark on Twitter. I'm also on Twitch. I got the blog. The links are everywhere. If you're listening to this, chances are you know who I am, you know what I'm about, and you know where to find my stuff. So until next time, this has been Best Boys, and we will see you all real soon. Bye, everybody. Which bring us to the other event. Take your seat at any early evening screening of Incredibles 2 in the coming days. Listen carefully, and you may just hear a shifty sound, as of parents squirming awkwardly beside their enraptured offspring. And why, kids? Because mommy just leaned over to daddy and whispered, Is it just me? Or does Mrs. Incredible kind of look like Anastasia in Fifty Shades of Grey? You know, the girl in the red room, with the whips and all. And Daddy just rested his cooling soda firmly in his lap and, 
like Mr. Incredible, tried very hard to think of algebra.